Hello, everyone. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Masahiro Terada. Uh, and uh, I'm a visiting professor of uh, research institute for humanity and nature. Today, uh, I am a uh, moderator of this academic session. I sincerely welcome to this in RIN Research Institute, uh, RIN, uh, RIN International Symposium, the fourth day. It is the organized by this research institute for humanity and nature and also co-organized by UASH USS, the French uh, School for Advanced Study for the Social Sciences. The venue is held in online, but as you have already noticed earlier, the main studio is held in traditional Kyoto townhouse. You may see the entire uh, room previously, and you can see those rooms in the next public session more detail, but uh, it might be interesting for you. If you want to know the places, uh, Tondaya, uh, you can uh, Google that uh, name. The Hirose san, uh, although I'm uh, moderate remotely, the Hirose san, uh, Kojiro Hirose, is in the studio of the traditional house, uh, Tondaya. So I would like to introduce today's uh, tema. This tema is the nature's art. The entire uh, symposium title is the art of living with nature. And the course of the symposium, we are proceeding gradually from the opening to reception and renewal. That is the gradual uh, transition, traditional Japan, uh, East Asian way of the uh, lyric. Based on those uh, notions, we are coming to the uh, transformation. Today, uh, we uh, investigate in the nature's arts. As already mentioned, uh, arts is the root meaning as arus in the Latin. Latin. It's a, it means the skilled labor, but also uh, the term uh, implies the uh, artistic activity. Skilled labor and artistic activity transform the nature of the arts. So the, we will investigate the meaning of such kind of activity, especially the human mind and body is how changed by the uh, activity or the bodily sense is uh, in which uh, ex extent bodily sense have changed from that uh, activity. Sensors, uh, sensuous and aesthetic experience as fundamental element of uh, learning and experience. So in this session, we would like to uh, investigate the meaning of those uh, um, things. The, uh, on the previous session, the first uh, thinking back the previous days, day two, our three uh, in 
intelligence, we are investigating the other than humans and also the fundamental condition of the humanity in the world, namely the cosmophony, uh, referring the notion of Fudo by Augustin Berg. In the day th uh, three, uh, garden planet techno diversity, we uh, uh, already investigate the uh, technology and the, or the notion of waza in Japanese. And also the problem of disaster and garden the time, etc. cetera, uh, invest, analyzed. Today, we are a little bit more uh, intensified the institutionalized or the disciplinarized uh, aspect of the art, art itself or the art as the practice of that kind of institutionalized or the disciplinarized way. We invite uh, sp two speaker from the museums and also one speaker from the uh, activity of artistic performance, or artistic, artistic institutionalization. Today we uh, have three uh, presentations. Uh, the order is changed slightly from the program. The at first we will have the presentation from by David Muggs, and then uh, we will have the Ota Tomoko and then Hirose Kojiro's presentation. So I would like to introduce uh, David Muggs at first. Uh, David Muggs is an artist and art researcher. He is now uh, he has uh, has bear, uh, he is the founder. Uh, he, he is trained by the artist and the, uh, as the pianist. He is the founder of the quintet, the Dark by Five, and also the, he is the artistic director of the Gross Moon Summer Music Festival. It is held in the Newfoundland uh, in the Canadian. Uh, Peninsula. The Newfoundland is the maybe Japanese uh, audience uh, familiar when we I refer the um, Lucy Ann Montgomery's novel <laughs> and the Green Gables Akage no Han, that uh, Newfoundland Island is next to the Prince Edward Island. <laughs> And also David Magus uh, uh, is the keen researcher, academic researcher. He uh, recently he published a co-authored book, Sustainability and Imagine, uh, Ima Imaginate, uh, Imagined, Imagining World by Routledge Express. And, and also he uh, co-authored uh, with the Iran Chabai, the academic piece in the, uh, about the sustainability and narrative. So uh, I would like to hand over my microphone to David Magus. So if you are muted, uh, are muted uh, you can start your timing. Terrific, thank you very much. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? This is good. Sight lines are good. Mic is good. Thank you. Thank you very much for that uh, generous introduction. Uh, I am uh, very honored to be here with you. I've heard so much about uh, Rin uh, over the years. I'm sorry that I can't be joining uh, joining that place. I do want to come there someday, but um, to join you <coughs> virtually, uh, we'll have to do today. I want to start thinking about the relationship between art and sustainability, uh, primarily um, with uh, a, a more basic question first, uh, where does sustainability come from? 
So this question is the focus of some work I'm doing right now uh, with John Robinson, uh, historian Greg Anderson, and Gregor Benza Keen. And we're beginning with the idea that standard ways of thinking about sustainability form three different layers, choices, behaviors, and policies, socio-technical systems, institutional design and governance structures, and values, beliefs, and worldviews. Now these three layers, behaviors, systems, and beliefs make two critical assumptions. First, that uh, the fundamental consumption of reality is fixed, uh, that the materialist account of the planet is not up for grabs here. And second, that the range of transformation is comprehensive. So this is as deep as change can go. But modeling uh, from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change perhaps hints at something else. So when the IPCC modeled climate impacts of different scenarios, incommensurably different realities without any climate policy in place, and then compared them to models of different climate policies applied to a single reality, we get more climate impact by changing realities than by changing, uh, changing policies. I'm not a climate modeler and I can't interrogate uh, these results with any sophistication at all, but what I hear in this illustration is the climate whispering something about itself. That that standard three layer cake of sustainability discourse, behaviors, systems and values may be incomplete and we may need to add something of a fourth layer change in that underlying reality or change at the level of world. Now, if this sounds like academic indulgence, uh, sort of postmodernism run amok, uh, as the historian on our team, Greg Anderson, illustrates, history is full of change that demonstrably alters the assumed foundations of reality. Humans have and continue to occupy fundamentally different worlds, different in ways that exceed changes to behavior, systems, and values. Yet, when we look at the strata of sustainability running from choices all the way to worlds, we notice an inverse relationship between leverage and agency, where agency is high at the level of choices and behaviors, but the leverage here is low. So it's easy to buy different kinds of apples, but it doesn't change very much. Or where the leverage of worlds, as the IPCC modeling shows us, is very high, but our ability to walk into incommensurably different realities is very low. So one might explain this through the dynamics of recursion, where if we create the world that creates us, that creates the world that creates us, we are as much the artifacts of our realities as we are their architects. So while most sustainability work is trying to change the chicken by getting it to walk differently or talk differently, what we really need is to change the egg that it comes out of. But how do we get the chicken to lay a different egg if the egg can't hatch a different chicken? Agency declines as we are increasingly the artifacts of our worlds, which is the same reason that leverage rises. And this makes such a human dilemma of sustainability as the problematic relationship that we have with our world mirrors the problematic relationship we have with ourselves. In other words, can we ever have agency where there is leverage? Can I choose anything about myself today other than my pants? Another way to think about this is through a question that emerged within my doctoral work. Uh, is the challenge of sustainability a challenge to prove the world real or a challenge to prove the world imaginary? Now, if you ask this question to most sustainability audiences, you get a blank look, but then if you explain yourself a little bit, you can work yourself up to a sort of fairly banal answer. Of course, the challenge is a challenge to prove the world real. We need to count the hectares, add up the fish, calculate the parts per million, and then tell people what to do. Yet this is a critical fork in the road for sustainability. For here, we have just played ourselves into the hands of society's favorite theory of change, the infamous information deficit model of behavior change, the faith that new information leads to new knowledge, which leads to new values, which leads to new behaviors. Now, this is simplistic enough that it never surprises people to hear that we've amassed 50 years of research compromising the theory 
What does surprise people is when they notice that virtually all of our change infrastructure from academia to government agencies to NGOs all the way to the IPCC still runs on a fundamental association of transformative change with knowledge dissemination. So while its underlying ideas have been repealed, this is built into society, which may seem contradictory that we would know that the information deficit model doesn't work and yet go on using it anyway. The contradiction actually illustrates the critique. So the best proof that the information deficit model doesn't work is to spend 50 years providing ourselves with the information that the information deficit model doesn't work and to notice how little impact this has on our use of information deficit models. Here, sustainability finds itself stuck trying to leverage the open imaginative possibilities of world via the closed material realities of planet. So no matter how much we seem to implore it, the chicken of undeniable reality cannot hatch the egg of unconstrained possibility. Sustainability might take some comfort to realize that it is not alone here. As Stephen Duncombe illustrates, uh, most progressive politics operates this way, trying to cultivate imaginary new worlds by dealing exclusively and often puritanically in undeniable truths. But notice the irony here. The politics trying to turn the world into something different works so earnestly in undeniable truth while the politics trying to keep the world the same is entirely content to deal in wild fantasy. Can we do better? Can we build the best of our planetary understandings into frameworks that better engage the imaginative machinery of possible worlds? The past decade of sustainability has featured so much progress, and yet every major indicator of sustainability continues to get worse, as if all of these advances are being undone by some unknown force. A metaphor that I heard recently seemed to capture this uh, predicament rather well, the idea that we are playing three-dimensional chess using a two-dimensional board that we are being beaten on a dimension that we can barely perceive, let alone navigate. Uh, so what is this missing dimension? How do we spot it? Is there a recent event perhaps where it has surfaced enough that we might catch sight of it? Within weeks of the 2016 US presidential election, the New York Times gave Donald Trump a 9% chance of winning that issues of identity and meaning large enough to put a president in the White House could remain that invisible shows both our inability to functionally perceive this dimension and the consequences that it has for progressive politics. Now, when you work in sciencey places like sustainability, everything that is not descriptive is normative. And so too often the normative just means human stuff, even though the idea of a norm does not encompass the range of human elements needing attention within sustainability challenges. So here our chessboard stays two dimensional. We default back to information deficit models and hope that somehow all the facts that we can no longer ignore eventually lead us into a world that we cannot yet imagine. What I propose here is for sustainability to extend its sense of the normative into a more specific and supportive idea of the deep subjective. And by deep subjectivity, I'm trying to identify and illuminate the realm of identity, meaning, purpose, perception, belief, our underlying and often unspoken existential relationships to place and time, and the deeper conceptions of self and world that we carry around unnoticed. So it is something of a methodological proposal subject to experimentation, what Bruno Latour might call empirical metaphysics, that the normative dimensions we might think of as deep subjectivity offer an interface with that layer of change that we added above, change at the level of world. So playing with the deep subjective is playing around with the genetic materials of our realities. Now, how on earth are we to do that? It may seem rather obvious at this point that I've been reverse engineering the sustainability crisis in order to make heroes of our arts. But I'm not alone here as this conference and, and others like it show this intersection between art and sustainability is increasingly popular. 
a recognition that sustainability engagements have been insufficient and that arts practices have significant capacity here. So that's the good news. There's this growing methodological consensus. The bad news is that the collective intuition is rarely accompanied by any of the methodological clarity we need to make good on the instinct. So we know what we want to do here. We just don't know quite how to do it. The idea that art is a potent force in society is nothing new, at least in the West, uh, from Plato's concern about transgressive poets uh, to the controls of church and state over artistic expression to Stalinist Russia considering artists the engineers of human souls to Bill McKibben crying out what the world needs now is art, sweet art. Despite stark differences in time and place, politics and ideology, they all share a common conviction that art is this unique and potent form of social agency. Why? Without the uh, common ground to this common conviction, something more autopoetic must be at play a self-producing dynamic constantly regrowing this basic belief that the perennial appeal to art from those of us hoping to foster change in our worlds requires nothing further than the evidence of art fostering change in ourselves. In other words, we turn to art to shape our society based on a tacit recognition of how art has shaped us. Now, if that is true, it tells us something very important for when we do that, when we say, hey, art changed me, so let's use art to change you, we're turning from a descriptive certainty to a prescriptive aspiration, from a what art did for me to what art will do for others. And it is here at this intersection that the transformative agency of art is so often lost. Because here, usually without noticing our sincere and very well-meaning efforts to apply the social agency of art, typically find themselves trying to replicate effects rather than processes. We are trying to reproduce what art does rather than understand how art works. Which brings me to a crucial distinction uh, in the relationship between art and sustainability, this difference between instrumentalizing our art versus aestheticizing our world. So fashioning art into a tool versus fashioning our world into something we relate to through the aesthetic. Why is this a problem? So what do we lose when we turn art into a tool? This grows clear if we consider art a combination of two essential powers, the power of expression and the power of attention. So the model becomes very simple, attention plus expression equals art. But of course, it's always the power of expression that our social concerns are interested in. We have something that we want to say and we want to say it as powerfully as we can. So the model becomes pre-existing content plus expression equals art, hereby eliminating the power of attention. Now, I've never met anyone who can tell me that art is made up of these two complementary powers, and yet everyone always knows if one of them is missing. This is described by George Steiner as the ability of art to foster an encounter with the unmastered thereness, the authentic agency of the thing inside the art. So the bird in the poem, the feeling in the song, the perception of the protagonist. Sense the bird or the feeling or the perception as something that was made up instead of something that was witnessed. And we do not trust the work. We do not give ourselves over to it. Or as George Steiner says, it is our apprehension of this unmastered thereness, which is indispensably the condition of trust. We yield rights of possession, says Steiner, precisely to the extent that we to experience the unmastered thereness of a secret share. So the agency of the thing that the art is about comes forward. Art with power, is art that we trust. And that trust comes when we encounter a collaboration between artist and thing that has been carried out in good faith. So we can put this quite simply in a unique value proposition. Art is the capacity to attend to the world through the aesthetic, to pay attention to the world in terms of form and pattern, texture, color, rhythm, harmony, imagery, scale, pitch, metaphor, frequency, 
and duration. And it is the artist's perception via creative practice that generates such a unique relationship to the world. So if we lose that balance of powers, if we lose the power of attention in these exchanges, we lose the relationality of the creative gesture, which costs us the condition of trust with the audience and the quality of attention so unique to artistic encounters disappears. Art is proof. Audiences encounter art and ask in sophisticated and embodied non-rational subconscious ways one simple question did you listen because if you want me to pay an aesthetic quality of attention i need to know that you did too and too often what we want in our more instrumental relationships with art is for the audience to pay that kind of attention without having to do so ourselves so this sense of art has obvious implications for transdisciplinary arts practices, but it can also inform standard forms of research such as ethnography. And I'll just close with a quick example of this to try and leave something concrete on the table. So Classica 2.0 is a research network looking at sustainability's normative dimensions through narrative frameworks. And here, uh, Elan Chabai and I are developing a strategy to map the normative in terms of that subjective, uh, that deep subjectivity, that missing dimension on our chessboard, in this case, through storytelling, uh, namely two features of storytelling, story structure and character development. And most audiences around the world uh, hold a highly evolved relationship with something known as three act structure. But if we think of this structure in terms of symbiosis between art and audience, what purpose did it evolve to serve? The story world has one answer to this question. All well-told stories from ancient myths to modern satires express one essential idea, how and why life changes. Storytelling is our central relationship to transformative change. If we cannot feel the forces of transformation at work, we stop paying attention. And the vehicle that carries us on this journey of transformation is the protagonist. And interestingly for sustainability, Protagonists don't need to be human. That's not what makes them vehicles of transformative change. What makes them vehicles of transformative change is something we're calling their algebra. So an essential and specific integration of four key elements, the want, the need, the lie, and the ghost. So very quickly, the want is what the protagonist wants to accomplish. It's one of life's trophies, typically an external goal, money, power, the winning the race, the job, etc. The need is that deeper yearning driving the protagonist. It's that dose of life's wisdom to belong, to be accepted, loved, understood. The lie is the false belief that prevents the protagonist from addressing their need instead of pursuing their wants. So the idea that people will only like me if I'm successful. And the ghost is the backstory fueling the lie. So a character's shaming experience of her mother's poverty and the exclusion it caused, for example. Now, solving for the algebra is not simply making things up. It's better to think of it like something like uh, rigging a sail where you need the right rope running through the right holes so that when you tie those four elements together, it pulls taut, catches wind and starts to move. And what Ilan and I are working on inside Classica is not how we create fictional characters using this algebra, but how this algebra helps us read the deep subjectivity of real places. So rather than a way to talk to communities, it is a way to listen to those communities. What are the wants in this place? What needs are buried beneath these wants? What lie makes that want convincing? And what ghost holds that lie in place? So here art is not a power of, ex of expression, but rather a power of attention. And here we glean from centuries and centuries of storytelling how to read a context in terms of its propensity for transformation. Rather than a message, this 
comes to us as a key. Find the ghost that produces the lie, that buries the need and drives the want, and the universal elements of transformation are in your hands. And so that's an example of taking the art sustainability relationship and moving it beyond instrumentalizing our arts and towards aestheticizing our worlds. Thank you very much. And I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing what the other uh, participants have to add to this conversation. Well, thank you very much, uh, David. The instru instrumentalization, zening the art and aesthetic world is very interesting and interesting new ideas and also the many interest overlap the before the discussions. So the after the three presentation, we will have the general discussion. So we I would like to accept one or to short question directly related to this presentation. If you have, uh, you, you can raise your hand or writing a Q and a slot. Sorry, I didn't mention this area. So, to respond, respond oh. I have one question uh, and two hand from the uh, um, uh, attendees. So one question though is that Vitaria Povilati from uh, Vitaria, where spirituality is in this, it, it is a question. So if the, you can send, and also Jako, uh, Mayako and Yoko Toda uh, raise quest, uh, hand. So sh if you can say shortly, briefly, Jako and Yoko Tada. So Jako san firstly, you can uh, say something with uh, unmuting the microphone. You can say in Japanese and the translator will translate into in English, I think. Jako san, can you unmute? Or Yoko Tada, can, can you unmute? Mm, it seems that it doesn't function so. So. David, can you answer where spirituality is in this? <laughs> sure, sure. And hopefully the my questions will resolve. Uh, I, I mean, I'd, I'd, I'd love to hear Vitaly actually uh, uh, answer that question herself or herself. Um, but certainly I think there's an overlap between the idea that uh, George Steiner is putting forward uh, in the relationship that we have with the aesthetic uh, when he's talking about the idea of the unmastered thereness, uh, you're verging on the sense of the transcendent in that case. Uh, you're leaning towards the idea of hearing some, from something uh, that lies beyond. So uh, you might think of that as the sort of beauty truth relationship uh, where there's a level of um, power, agency, authority speaking through the aesthetic, which I think is very close to our intuitions about the spiritual as well, which is, I think, why many people have such a spiritual relationship with arts practices and also why art 
is always such a, f- a factor in in spirituality and religion, formal and informal approaches uh, to the transcendent. So it's a I think that idea of of witnessing um, and and the idea of a, a sort of a transcendent presence uh, is very close to what I am saying. I realize this gets us into a, a you know a larger conversation about do we mean a kind of absolute power or do we mean a sort of something that is um, driven by intersubjectivity? So intersubjectivity being different than objectivity in this case, um, but nonetheless, I feel like the the disposition, the character that it ev- evokes in us to be attending to the world in terms of the aesthetic is very similar to a, a spiritual orientation uh, to the world. Thank you very much. And I see the Frederick Julian is writing hard, but it, uh, because of limitation of time, I would like to pass, uh, go towards the next presentation. So uh, the, the further discussion will be in the general discussion. So thank you, David. Marcus, for the, your presentation, and see you the later. So we will uh, proceed the next presentation. Next presentation is uh, Ota Tomoko from uh, the Yamanashi Prefecture uh, Art Museum. Her presentation is Kurita Koichi and Suda Yoshihiko uh, about the uh, uh, exhibition we, uh, which is curated by uh, Ota san. So the maybe Ota san introduce uh, the Yamanashi Prefecture Museum by yourself. So I do not introduce that museum. So please uh, begin the uh, your presentation when you are uh, okay. Thank you very much for the introduction. Can I start sharing my screen? Let me start sharing my screen. My name is Ota Tomoko. I am a curator from Yamanashi Prefecture Museum of Arts. Thank you very much for the invitation to this event today. So I belong to a small museum located in rural area. So today I'm going to share with you a exhibition that we organize. So this is an example of a practice in a local museum. In 2020s, we organized uh, this uh, exhibition, Kurita Koichi Suda Yoshihiro, contains many in the details. So I'd like to share a story about this exhibition. But first of all, I'd like to introduce Yamanashi Prefecture Museum of Art, which is located in Kofu city of Yamanashi Prefecture and opened in 1978. And Jean-François Muret is one of our major uh, artworks that we um, exhibit. So these are the, I didn't, not, and these are the you know, major artwork um, that depict people who uh, work on the ground. And in this museum, we organize this exhibition and both uh, Kurita and Suda, they are from the Fuefuki city of Yamanashi prefecture, but they are uh, very active in the world. I'd like to uh, share with you some of the artworks of these artists. This artwork is in Honen Inn Temple in Kyoto. They recognize what they are. The Kurita um, collect uh, different soils from different parts of Japan, and they or Kurita uh, organize the soil libraries. So Kurita and collect the soils from different different parts of Japan. Then he dried it and then give some color. And actually, Kurita has collected uh, soil from all 
local municipalities of Japan, which counts over 3,000. And they have a different colors, as you can see. And uh, in France, there is a word, terroir. It's because maybe French, French people has a great interest in soil. And he actually organized a lot of exhibition in France as well. This is a type that those uh, soils are shown on washi paper. And also this is another type of his artwork. And this is another type of his artwork. The soils are inside the glass glasses. And the next one, this is an artwork of Suda. So between um, the uh, crevice of the uh, wooden floor, there are the uh, grass uh, growing, which are made by carved wood. And this is a uh, made out of the uh, magnolia tree. And this is one of the installations. For Suda, what is important is the uh, combination between space and wooden carved sculpture. And this is the combination with the traditional cultural artifact in Japan. For example, this is a combination of his, his work together with one of the national treasures of Japan. And this is very realistic and sometimes audience report to that to the museum there is a grass growing inside the showcase this is another artwork so this is quite a beautiful flower and that is actually shown on the wall and if they are placed outside you can't really tell which one is a real uh, grass and uh, I wish to introduce these two artists in Yamanashi. They are a local town. They have organized uh, exhibitions in France as well. And first one was organized in 2004. And also in 2017, uh, they organized another exhibition, which is called Jardin. And if you try to and find a commonality between two artists. Uh, basically, they deal with something natural, like uh, soil or a plant. And their artwork is always very consistent. And they actually pay attention to something very small, which are not being paid attention by other people. And also, they are from the Yamanashi prefecture, uh, their hometown. Therefore, maybe Yamanashi. Um, it's actually acted upon on their sensitivity, on their artwork. Well, it's very important to pay attention to the uh, locality or uniqueness of a local community in order for us to rediscover the value of locality. However, before that um, COVID-19 broke out in the world, that dramatically changed our daily life. And then we once again, look at their works from different perspective influenced by the uh, COVID-19. So I'd like to start sharing uh, their uh, artworks in this exhibition. The theme is uh, rules of origin or Yamanashi. Uh, those are the themes for the room one. This is artwork of Kurita. They are the soil from Yamanashi Prefecture, 100 different types of soils. Some colors are very peculiar. They don't seem to be soil, but they are from the Yamanashi Prefecture. And you see the label of the local city or local municipality attached to the each glass. Therefore, the audience can find their city name. And this is the uh, artwork of Kurita. The Krita uh, found soils after traveling around the world. And this is another artworks, uh, Poya Day. So this is a day of full moon. And this exhibition 
has been carried out since 1991, and then he have collected a numeral number of stones. And this is another artwork of uh, Suda. So this is a weed, um, and then actually the, the weed and added during the exhibition. To show the locality of hometown of Suda, he created these carved grass. These are the because uh, he was forced to uh, do uh, reading when he was a child. And this is another artwork. He actually created this artwork when he was a student and he was surprised. That's why he continued the uh, sculpture and artwork. This is another one. This is a tulip. And uh, the another tulip was added on the wall so the audience can enjoy two different types of tulip. And there are Kurita and Suda. And room two, the Kurita laid down 1,000 soils, which come from different parts of Japan. It took about 10 days to lay down those soils. And uh, those are shown to the audience in the final two days. I'd like to show you a video clip how he actually laid down those soils. And these are close up of both soils. Those are soils of just uh, that can be found anywhere, but then um, colors are so peculiar. And the room three is another type of Suda's artwork, right hand side. So there is a flower of Taizanboku a tree of Kao Mountain, and uh, this is another one. This is a box that they can pull, people can pull, and then at the end of the box, uh, there is a wooden carved, or carved wooden uh, grass. This was presented in the uh, Gin Ginza, the uh, most expensive uh, areas in Japan in terms of the land value, but uh, what they can find is uh, just a weed. And this is another one. Um, this uh, pond itself is made out of the uh, alaka wheel. And if you look close uh, here, these are all the alaka, uh, and then 
you see the flowers are placed on the black background of lacquer and room four now there are artworks are divided into two uh, rooms which goes in parallel and these are about eight thousand um, types of styles as you can see the styles come from different parts of japan so he traveled different parts uh, of japan and then he collected the soils from different location and each one of those soils show different colors and Kurita say these uh, soils well he can find the people of each uh, place if he look at each soil and these are the locations from where he collected soils and this is another one for uh, Suga. So audience can find his artwork if they peep into the wall and these are uh, the entrance hall where their artworks also presented. So on the wall you see the morning glory and also this is some, uh, one of the artworks of Millet, a uh, person who see it. And this is a, co a combination of this artwork and his artwork. So the title is Weed and Buckwheat. So his artworks is growing from the ground just between floor and wall. So what does Yamanashi mean to the two artists? We Kurita present soil in its natural state. And this is based on the traditional practice of Maru Ishigami, where people in Yamanashi enshrine those round stone and uh, round stones as gods, for example, like this one. Well, sometimes they call it Yashikigami and enshrine inside their vicinity, inside their um, house garden. And then it's basically like uh, local sensitivity, how they see natural stone as God. And Kurita, conduct the physical expressions, which takes place in forests and beaches. And he traveled around the world, and he came back and discovered the variety of soils in Japan, and he connected that to the idea of his artwork that to present soils as Marui Shigami. And as for Suda, this is a combination of plants and space. So why he picked up the plants as his topic of an artistic work? Actually, Suda was born into a family that runs a tourist farm, and he wasn't really interested in the plant itself when he was small, but then when he was in Tokyo, he couldn't really adapt to the life in Tokyo. And this is a um, picture um, of the uh, community where Suda was born. And this is another picture. So this is the location where Suda was raised. And then when he faced the flowers, he, and he felt that uh, he was actually raised by flowers. And then he feel, he said he feels like flowers, making him create his art. And this is a reversal of the subject and object. 
So it's like as if the artist or the viewer is being seen by the plant. So Suda takes the stance of being equal to plants or the plants being subject. And Suda never forget about life in his local town. And uh, both artists' works are created delicately by hand, and also they shed light on something that is small in nature that shows the relationship. We are humans and natures are on equal terms, and that is related to viewing humans from a relative point of view. Kurita treats soils like a living organism, and Suda thinks that humans are being used by the plants. And these attitudes are actually influenced by their hometown, Yamanashi. And uh, Kurita uh, cite the stone, the Atsukubai in Ryoanji Temple, Ware Tada Taru wa Shiru, to know the feeling of contentment. And Suda's artwork is often referenced in the context of Sado. And if you go back this um, kind of a thought, you can lead to the Taoism. And for example, Suzuki Daitetsu translated a verse in Tao Te Chang as the one who knows contentment is rich. So over the last two years, uh, just one small virus affected us a lot. We have been tormented by a small virus, but it was an actually important opportunity for us to rediscover the importance of knowing contentment. So what, what would happen if we were to relativize humans and find one thing to focus on for a long period of time? Maybe each one of us cannot do something big, but um, in our daily lives, we can continue something small. And if you do so, you might be able to discover a new world. That is how I and saw it from this exhibition. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ota-san. Uh, very interesting. And, uh, profound conclusion of the spirituality of the flower and soil and art. So I'd like to accept one or two quick, quick, uh, brief question. If you have a, you can raise your hand or enter into the Q&A slot. Um, I see one hand from Ayamagi was signed. So please uh, unmute your mic. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. But then, at last, you said the artist felt like he was being asked to create art by the flowers, that is similar to the thinking of animism. So how the artist reflect on that kind of sensitivity on his art? Well, well Suda-san said that um, I want to create the uh, plan artworks as far as the plan allow me to do so. So whether I can find animism or whether he um, find animism in it, I'm not sure. But he basically create flowers that he likes. So by continuing creating the, the flowers that he likes. That is the basic stance for him. But then he said to me that he is actually moved 
he is actually driven by flowers to make his artworks. So I'm not sure whether I can answer your question regarding relation to the animism. Well, the why I mention animism, sorry for jumping in, in Yakushima, there's Yamao Sansei, a poet. He wrote the book, Animism and Hope. According to him, the, the modern animism is that uh, once you find something you like, that becomes a god. That's what he says. So it's not seeing objects as it is. It is seeing an object in relation to it. With sense of all, if you see a object, then he said it, you are able to interact with the object. So not looking at environment as a subject, but actually we are being by the an object. When you see a trees, trees are also watching you. And if there's an exchange, and if you uh, become like it, then that object is a god. So that is the uh, uh, animism he said in his book. So this is the reason why I raised this question. Well, we actually, he said he uh, makes uh, flowers. He makes only the flower that he likes, and I'm not sure whether he uh, is in the sense of having any kind of animism sense of uh, thinking, but uh, he is well versed with plants and he knows plants very much and he uh, sees the plants very carefully and based on uh, understanding of the plant, he creates his artwork. Oh, okay, thank, thank you very, very much. much. Yamagiya-san and Tobuta-san, uh, the question and the answer is very profound. And we will proceed the uh, next, uh, thank you, Tobuta-san, again. And we will proceed the next presentation. Uh, it is made by Hirose Kojiro-san from the Mu uh, National Museum of Ethnology in Osaka. The title is the re Reading the Story of Miminashi Hoichi by Rafka Duhan. Why do blind people view cherry blossoms? I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Hirose-san. He serves as a uh, assistant professor, associate professor at the uh, National Museum of Ethnography. He lost sight in his 13 years old, and he graduated a special needed education school for visually impaired at Tsukuba University. And he got a PhD uh, uh, PhD title in Kyoto University, and then come to the uh, National Museum of uh, ethnography. He is very uh, famous for the uh, provocating the touch or the taste, uh, touching or the tasted season, uh, sensation. He published many numerous books, uh, including the pre, uh, previous uh, pre, uh, previous book is about the close touch in time of the COVID-19. And he also uh, uh, curated the special exhibition in the National Museum of Ethnography about the uh, tactile sensation in to uh, in uh, bef uh, 2021, uh, previous year, under the COVID-19 situation. So I'd like to hand over the microphone to Hirose-san. So please begin uh, your presentation. Hi, thank you very much. My name is Hirose uh, from the 
National Museum of Ethnology. And uh, in this kind of uh, international symposium, uh, I should uh, uh, probably be uh, speaking in English, and uh, it would be a great opportunity to uh, uh, announce that uh, in uh, English. Uh, however, uh, the theme is nature, and it is natural for me to speak in Japanese. Therefore, I will be speaking in Japanese. And also, my apologies uh, to the overseas participants. Uh, with regard to Lafcadio Hearn, I know that you uh, are aware of him, but uh, I must say that uh, this uh, a story of Miminashi Hoichi may not be a, a story that you are familiar with, but uh, I would like to speak uh, on the basis of uh, the assumption that you already know the story of uh, Miminashi Hoichi. Uh, so if you uh, do not know uh, the story and if you uh, cannot understand uh, my presentation, I apologize for that. So at the very beginning, last fall, I published a, a picture book. Uh, the title is To Touch the Sound. It is a picture book, a picture book to see. However, uh, you can enjoy the book by touching it. Uh, there are different uh, ideas used in uh, printing this uh, book. In, cre in creating uh, this uh, picture book, uh, there were many thoughts put into it. And the basic uh, thought that I put into this book is, as I have uh, written uh, in the resume, uh, it's uh, the cherry blossom viewing, uh, hanami uh, in Japanese. Uh, it's becoming spring. Uh, and uh, Japanese like to view the cherry blossoms uh, from the end of March to early April uh, when the cherry uh, trees uh, blossom, uh, bloom. Uh, we uh, enjoy uh, viewing the cherry blossoms and uh, we celebrate the, the coming of spring. It is a kind of a custom or uh, that uh, we enjoy in Japan. And uh, so I lost my view uh, when at the age of 13, and I cannot see at all. Uh, however, uh, blind people, as myself, enjoy uh, cherry blossom viewings. And uh, some people are surprised to hear that. But as a kind of a catchphrase, uh, I say that uh, we don't see the cherry blossoms uh, when we uh, view the uh, cherry blossoms, but uh, we touch the, the flowers, we we, touch, we um, put our face uh, to close to the cherry blossoms. Cherry blossoms uh, do not have such uh, uh, strong order, but uh, uh, there is a, uh, uh, the smell that we can enjoy. And also we can enjoy uh, eating a delicious food uh, under the cherry trees. Uh, of course, of course, of COVID-19, uh, we are not able to do so in recent years, but uh, uh, I am promoting this uh, cherry blossom viewing without seeing the flowers. The phrase uh, may be impactful, however, uh, to the people who have eyesight uh, can see the uh, flowers and uh, they enjoy the, the beauty of the view of the cherry blossoms. That is the culture. And to that uh, uh, cherry blossom viewing without seeing cherry blossoms uh, may uh, sound like uh, we are kind of uh, discriminating the people who have eyesight. And so recently I have changed my phrase. So I uh, use the the character love uh, in order to express uh, flower loving or flower admiring. So, uh, so uh, to admire uh, is to appreciate uh, uh, things uh, using various senses. Uh, however, in recent years, in the recent, recent modern society, uh, the visuality is dominant. And uh, so people think that uh, flower or cherry blossom uh, viewing is to really view it uh, with our eyes. Uh, however, uh, I am trying to say that that is not always the case. Um, so uh, flower viewing uh, can be flower admiration uh, using different senses rather than eyesight. So by uh, placing this question, I, I know that this uh, 
uh, Chinese characteristic uh, characters are different to be translated into English. But uh, rather than flower viewing, I am trying to say that it is flower admiration or flower loving, uh, using uh, a different uh, Chinese characters, uh, switching uh, the Chinese character of uh, seeing to loving. And so I have uh, been saying this uh, for a while, and uh, I wanted to convey this idea uh, to children uh, in a universal manner. And that is the reason why uh, in this picture book, uh, I try to express the uh, four seasons uh, a scenery, the scenery of four seasons. And uh, this can also be enjoyed not only by looking at the book, uh, but also by feeling at the book. And so including the uh, touch of the uh, various plants included, uh, we have uh, created this book uh, so that people can enjoy uh, the book by touching the book. So that was my introductory uh, part of my presentation. And so in this uh, age of visual dominance, I am trying to say something. I am trying to uh, cast a question uh, that may not always be the, the essence of human beings. And I think this is a part of my life work as well. So, as uh, Terada-san introduced, last uh, autumn, uh, from September to November for three months, uh, we did a, a large exhibition, and uh, the theme uh, of this exhibition was to, of course, touch. Uh, in the uh, uh, Museum of, of Ethnology, I have worked here for 20 years now, and uh, it has always been a visual dominant uh, museum in the past, but uh, I wanted to uh, restore the, uh, the tactile uh, since. And uh, so I have been always thinking how we can do an exhibition uh, in which we can uh, focus on the tactile sense. And uh, so uh, in for that purpose, we did a large uh, exhibition and my preparation started from 2018. So coincidentally, uh, because of this uh, COVID-19, our project uh, had to be delayed. So I have been uh, making preparation for this exhibition, uh, uh, focusing on uh, touch or tactile senses. And uh, so uh, actually, uh, this exhibition was to be held in 2020, but uh, it was delayed by one year because of COVID because the number of cases uh, in during this period, uh, the number of cases uh, went up and declined and went up and declined uh, many times. So, however, uh, in 2021, uh, September, uh, we were able to open this uh, exhibition. The number of visitors, unfortunately, it would, it would, was not as great as uh, we had expected because of the COVID-19 and because of the uh, state of emergency, but uh, on the other hand, uh, well, because of COVID-19, uh, we uh, stress the fact that uh, contact is bad. I mean, uh, contact leads to um, uh, infection, but uh, uh, I was able to cast the question, is it really okay to not uh, get in contact with uh, people uh, and things. Uh, this uh, place that I am at uh, is in a, a very a traditional uh, space of Japan of a uh, townhouse. And uh, uh, of course, you can look at uh, this uh, partially uh, online. Uh, however, to actually come here and to um, step on the tatami mats and step on the uh, the old floors and uh, sometimes it squeaks uh, because of the uh, old uh, uh, architecture and however uh, this kind of feelings that I am able to enjoy uh, being here is not fully conveyed uh, through online so so uh, what I wanted to uh, do uh, with this exhibition is this, uh, the usage of five senses is uh, very important. Touching is very important. In spite of the fact because of COVID, we are saying that we should not touch things. So 
it is a exhibition uh which uh, it is not an exhibition which says you can touch it is an exhibition which says you must touch so so looking back i think it was very significant that we were able to hold this uh, uh exhibition uh in the midst of a covid 19 uh pandemic i think there was a um a social impact in the sense that uh, we promoted touching uh, contact uh, when we were uh, saying that we shouldn't be touching in COVID. So these are some of the uh, pieces of work uh, that uh, we exhibited uh, in this special exhibition. So the pictures that you see on this slide, uh, because it was an exhibition for touching, the materials uh, were collected uh, in various ways. And uh, this uh, stone sculpture, I don't think you can uh, appreciate the, uh, the size uh, fully by just looking at the photographs, but uh, the uh, sculpture is uh, very big and uh, you can climb on it. So it's not just for looking, you can climb on it and touch and uh, you can really feel the sculpture. So let's move on to slide number three. And this is about Mimi Nashi Hoichi, the story of Mimi Nashi Hoichi. So it's a wooden uh, work of art. Uh, this is a uh, Hoichi uh, carved uh, by wood, uh, carved of wood, shall I say. And uh, also, in this uh, special exhibition, uh, we also had a lot of uh, work of art uh, using soil or earth. Um, much is pottery. And uh, uh, on the right hand side, uh, sound is something that uh, you should feel using the five senses. And so uh, this, the, these uh, potteries are to be hit and tapped uh, to enjoy the sound. So. The people who cannot hear also can enjoy uh, this work by uh, feeling the vibration uh, of the sound. So let's move on to the story of uh, Mimi Nashi Hoichi. Uh, this is a story that was written by Lafcadio Hearn uh, based upon a, an old uh, uh, folk uh, story uh, of Japan. And so uh, it was during a period uh, in 1904, 1904, uh, it was a story uh, written in uh, Kaidan. Uh, uh, and uh, Miminashi Hoichi is the uh, main uh, character. And uh, there is a, a folk story, uh, which is the basis of this uh, Miminashi Hoichi. And uh, this Hoichi is a, a blind uh, biwa player and he uh, is uh, taken to the uh, Heike uh, ghost, a group of Heike ghosts. And uh, because he cannot see, he thought uh, uh, he was invited to a, a party of uh, uh, people, uh, however, or warriors. However, it was actually the, a party of the ghosts of Heike. And uh, however, uh, his, uh, um, Master, uh, who is the priest, uh, uh, tries to save uh, Hoichi uh, by writing a sutra all over his body. And uh, this uh, writing of sutra has two meanings. Uh, that is to make him invisible from the uh, ghosts. Uh, however, the other meaning of this is uh, because uh, Hoichi is blind, uh, he has the ability to feel uh, many things uh, through his five senses. Uh, and uh, one of them is uh, to communicate uh, with the uh, ghost. Uh, so uh, there was a belief uh, in Japan that uh, we are able to, uh, there are ghosts all over the place uh, behind the uh, plants. And uh, normally uh, people do not have the ability to communicate with such ghosts. But uh, because of uh, Hoichi, because he's uh, um, blind, he has that uh, ability. However, by writing a sutra all over his body, his uh, uh, such ability uh, was uh, taken away. 
And so I think there were two meanings in uh, writing the sutra all over his body. So uh, the reason why I have taken up the story of Miminashi Hoichi, uh, this is related to COVID-19 pandemic. As Ota-san said, uh, why do human beings, uh, why are the human beings so uh, afraid of uh, COVID-19? One is because we cannot see the, uh, the virus. So what is the scary is because we cannot see uh, the uh, virus. Maybe uh, virus is all over this place, but we cannot see it. And that is the reason why we wear masks and uh, uh, we sanitize ourselves and try to keep ourselves uh, protected from this uh, invisible uh, virus. And maybe we are um, exaggerating in being so afraid of uh, such virus. Uh, in the Hoichi age, I think uh, people were able to communicate with uh, invisible things uh, more than we can in modern days in the past. And uh, uh, in those days, probably they were able to coexist with the virus, maybe. Uh, that is something that I think uh, of uh, Hoichi and uh, the age that he lived in. But Japan has uh, modernized. Uh, well, uh, this story was written in the age when Japan was uh, headed towards modernization in 1904. So uh, people started to uh, believe in uh, things that we can see, but is this correct? In the past, uh, uh, people uh, respected the nature and respected things uh, that we could not see. I think that was uh, uh, Hoichi's period. And then there's the, uh, the world of priests and the, the world of evil ghosts or goblins. Or... So the priest world is to pay respect to something that we see, and that was the sutra. Uh, but the, the world of uh, ghosts are uh, uh, the world of things that you cannot see. Uh, in the period before Edo, uh, the invisible world and the visible world coexisted. The invisible world was uh, sometimes uh, dominating. However, because of modernization, uh, it has become uh, visible uh, dominated or visual dominated. So uh, something that is seen, something that uh, we can see has become uh, more dominant than uh, ever. And therefore invisible things are, are being uh, disrespected. And uh, so the two sides, are being pulled, and uh, in, in between uh, there is Hoichi, and eventually uh, Hoichi's uh, ears are um, taken away or cut off. So shall we move on to the fourth slide? So this is an academic session, so I should uh, uh, be a little uh, academic. Uh, I shouldn't be just talking about entertainment, uh, seeing the cherry blossoms. So the basis of my research is uh, about uh, Biwa Hoshi, uh, the Biwa play in uh, minstrel, and uh, Goze, uh, which is a uh, blind female beggar playing uh, shamisen and singing, and Itako, the spiritual medium or psychic or shaman. Uh, uh, so my research is all on these uh, uh, people. And uh, these people lived uh, uh, in the era before Edo period in Japan. And uh, the fact that uh, they were not able to see was not considered as uh, a negative, but the fact that they were not able to see was uh, understood, appreciated in a positive way because they had some other ability that uh, uh, people who could see did not have. However, uh, these people uh, started to disappear after uh, the 21st century or in the 21st, 21st century of Japan. So uh, these days, uh, we see none of these people. Uh, I mean, they have become almost e extinct. On the other hand, the job for the blinded people have uh, become diverse. So um, the blind people 
do not have to become Biwa Hoshi or Gozeo or Itako. That's one interpretation. But on the other hand, maybe a, a traditional uh, sense of value to respect, pay respect to the blind people uh, have deteriorated. And therefore, uh, these uh, jobs for the blind, blind people have uh, started to disappear. So from that uh, perspective, the era of uh, Miminashi Hoichi uh, the sense of value, the, the sense of value of the era of Hoichi uh, is quite different from the sense of value that we have today. I think there was a, a great turning point uh, in between. So uh, in this uh, slide, uh, you are looking at uh, paints that you can feel. So these are three dimensional or uh, version of a painting or paintings. The fifth slide, this will be my last slide. So uh, as has been said, uh, based upon uh, the tactile uh, census, uh, we did a uh, exhibition and I think uh, we were able to uh, give a social impact uh, to the society. And uh, also the questionnaires uh, that we collected, uh, the feedback was quite positive. And uh, the visitors uh, said that uh, they have come to re-recognize the, uh, the value of touching, the value of uh, uh, using our tactile senses. This uh, was a great feedback to us, uh, but uh, if it's just one experience, that is not enough. Maybe they think uh, coming to the museum, they enjoy touching, but uh, after uh, coming, going back home, they uh, might uh, uh, prevent themselves from touching things because of COVID. So how can we uh, develop the tactile culture to a tactile civilization? That is uh, uh, our uh, theme uh, going forward. So uh, this culture or this uh, experience uh, to be shifted or to be developed into a civilization or a social trend is something that I would like to uh, continue to consider. And uh, one of them uh, is the touch art that I'm introducing here. Uh, it is something that was uh, created uh, by uh, tactile senses and something that you can appreciate uh, through your tactile senses. Uh, this, uh, the work of art uh, that is uh, uh, being created by the blinded, uh, blind students. Uh, this is the uh, pottery uh, entitled Sound of Whistle Bottles. Uh, this is from the South America. Uh, this is a, a traditional work uh, originated uh, in South uh, America. And so, and also on the right hand side, the title of this work is uh, The Shiny uh, Bowl. And uh, this is uh, made by a person by the name of Toshio Matsui. Bowel or intestine. We, we can't see intestine. It uh, exists, but uh, it is very difficult to see it uh, directly. Uh, but, but if you uh, put your hand inside this uh, piece of work, it is uh, uh, very shiny and it's very slippery. Uh, the outside uh, is uh, very uh, friction oriented, but if you put your hand inside this pottery, it's very shiny and it's very smooth and you can be surprised by this. And so it is a pottery that uh, uh, you can uh, enjoy by actually touching it. So through this art uh, works, you are able to experience something that is uh, different uh, from just language or letters or characters. And uh, I think uh, more artists uh, should create such uh, arts, uh, artistic work or work of arts uh, that uh, can be appreciated uh, by uh, touching. Can I read my uh, poem? Do I have time to read a poem? Yes, yes, of, of course, yes. So, as a summary, uh, I would like to read a poem that uh, I have written. 
But uh, uh, if you could close your eyes and listen to my poem, what happened to Hoichi after his ear was torn off? Hoichi was in pain, reminded that he had been too focused on his ears. Hoichi listens hard, trying to hear a message from the unseen world. The voice of people, the sound of the wind, and the presence of all things breathing. By training his ears, Hoichi honed his skills as an entertainer. And now the precious ears have been cut off. Hoichi, who was blind, gained the power of his ears to live and the confidence to do so. Hoichi, who has lost his ears, realized that speech is not something to be heard with ears. The scripture that the monk or the priest wrote on Hoichi's, Hoichi's body soon disappeared. The sutra characters, as if to erase the words, thousands of hands antenna sprout from every pore of the body. O mortal, take back your antenna. Hoichi, who has lost his ears, learns the art of grasping the essence of things with his whole body. Leaving the constraints of seeing with his eyes and hearing with his ears, Hoichi starts to walk free. Those who can and those who cannot, winners and losers, civilized and uncivilized, healthy and disabled. Seeing with the eyes, hearing with the ears is not enough for humans to overcome dichotomous, dichotonomous uh, values. Hoichi tells us that there is a view even without eyes Hoichi sings, even if you don't have ears, there is music. Finally, Hoichi discards his biwa instrument, the instrument that connects the other world to this world, sight to hearing and things to people. Because Hoichi, who has antenna, no longer needs his biwa. Now Hoichi without biwa tickles our pores, transcending time and space to convey the richness of feeling of living. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Hirose-san. I closed my eyes and hear your poems and I feel that something is flowing around my body or inside my brain so the question uh, if some question directly related to hirose san's uh, presentation is welcome but the we have 25 minutes so if you have some question related uh, directly to hirose san's and broaden the topic into the general question if it, it will be welcomed. So, Predic, uh, please. Thank you very much. I just activate my sound. Uh, thank you, Hirose san. It was very, very interesting. Uh, and I've, um, I, I'm not sure to have understood pretty well uh, what you mean by 3D, 3D paintings uh, because I didn't know about that. Um, it, are 3D paintings made uh, from 2D paintings before or made as sculpture as a, you presented sculpture at the beginning or a different moment? Is it a, a, pro, a particular process from 2D to 3D, or is this uh, directly made in 3D? That's a very small question. And uh, uh, listening to your, um, your poem at, at the end, I think um, have came the idea of um, uh, 3D printers. 
3D printers are, could be sometimes used as to make objects, impossible object, I would say, impossible sculpture. And um, for, for blind people, perhaps uh, they can be used. I don't know if they are already used for that, for that purpose, but perhaps it's, it is a possibility to develop um, kind of um, reflection and intelligence on um, uh, impossible objects, kind of cameras and uh, um, without any logics. And uh, I just suggest the, this, this possibility is not developed yet. Thank you. Hi, thank you for your uh, question and comment. So could you share the uh, slide uh, number four once again? Could someone share uh, the slide number four? Yes, we hear the slide number. It's three. Oh, it's four. Yes. あの、北斎のやつとかも出てきます。はい。すいません、あの、ここはもう少しきちんと説明しないと。あ、maybe but uh, with regard to uh, paintings or um, photographs, uh, paintings and photographs are something that you actually see, you appreciate them uh, by looking at it. But uh, uh, we try to make something uh, that you can appreciate uh, without seeing by touching. That's the, the piece of work on the right hand side. So uh, the paintings are being conveyed the essence of the paintings uh, are being conveyed uh, by using a three-dimensional uh, purpose if it's only two purpose uh, i don't think we can fully enjoy uh, or appreciate the paintings so uh, we are trying to reinterpret and recreate something this is hokusai's uh, ukiyoe uh, the wave uh, and the the ship uh, painting of Hokusai, the famous, uh, and there's the uh, Mount Fuji on the other side, a very famous uh, ukiyoe by Hokusai. Uh, this was uh, reproduced in a three-dimensional way. So if uh, it was Hokusai, if he was to make a sculpture of the ukiyoe, uh, what would it look like it was the, uh, the imagination that was uh, used for creating this uh, artwork. So uh, we recreated Hokusai's uh, ukiyoe uh, as a sculpture. That's the left-hand side. And uh, the right-hand side, uh, maybe you can only enjoy uh, like Goh, Goh or Magrid. Uh, famous uh, paintings were made in this way. Uh, this is Kyoto a Municipal uh, Art University. Uh, the senior students uh, created this. So it's a visual design. Visual design is for looking. A graphic design is for showing or for viewing. But uh, uh, to these uh, uh, students, we asked them uh, to create something uh, so that uh, visually impaired people can also enjoy. And so we uh, asked these students to select a famous uh, a painting and to create something which is uh, three dimensional so that uh, visually impaired people can also enjoy. So uh, this uh, artwork is a uh, work of students, as I said. So 3D paintings is not just for welfare, uh, it's something that I would like for you to understand. And with regard to the 3D printer, from a museum point of view, uh, we do have great uh, expectations towards the 3D printers and Japanese um, museums are using uh, such, such uh, technology. 
so a uh, national treasure, uh, these cannot be actually touched. But uh, with 3D data, we can uh, replicate uh, such uh, national treasures. And uh, so regardless of whether you can see or not, the healthy people also want to touch such national treasures. <laughs> so um, if there's a original uh, treasure, which you cannot uh, touch, uh, if there is a replica uh, uh, side by side to it, and if you can touch the replica, if the replica can be uh, used so that the visitors can really touch, I think it would be uh, very nice. So that is the purpose of the use, usage of 3D printers in museums. And uh, uh, in case of uh, 3D printers, it is uh, basically a resin uh, that is used. Uh, as materials. However, uh, there are other materials like aluminums uh, uh, that can be used uh, so that uh, the touch uh, of the 3D printer works can uh, have the feeling which is very close to the original uh, piece of work. And also, as you, can, you asked, uh, including the touch, uh, we can use something, we can create something uh, using 3D printers that uh, is not possible. So thank you very much. For your question. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Hirose-san. Thank, thank you. So we will change uh, here after the into the general discussion. We will have 20 minutes uh, so far. So there are many overlaps to the uh, preceding discussion and also the uh, Daniel so uh, please go ahead okay you can hear me yes okay great yeah thank you all uh, very much for those presentations each of them really interesting in their own way um, and I I want to ask a question in a way of, of all three of you um, beginning going in the same order as your uh, presentations were offered. Because David, um, I thought your presentation is really interesting. Um, your way of thinking about the arts is uh, very fascinating. Um, and yet the way in which you use the arts in order to intervene in the sustainability discussion you, you seem to want to move from an instrumentalization of the arts to this level of deep subjectivity. Um, and you use the, the, the idea of the narrative um, as a way uh, of, of, of getting into that, those, that level of deep subjective experience. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that was very interesting. And yet I wonder exactly how you think about the arts and maybe I come back to you at the very end, because uh, Otasan's presentation is really uh, fascinating. The art exhibit exhibits are really beautiful, uh, very striking and compelling visually, interesting to look at. And you feel um, that you want to get closer to those materials, to those colors, but you cannot actually in the exhibit, you cannot touch. It's quite clear there from those exhibits that there is no touching allowed. And so this bring me uh, really to uh, Hirose san's ideas because he offer us mm. the challenge to use the whole body mm. to experience the world, uh, to get more at the richest of life. And this to me seems to speak to this deep subjectivity that David, you were uh, 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 opening at the beginning. And so, I wonder if you, each of you, how you, are we talking about the same kind of art mm -hmm. or what are we thinking about is the art of the world? Mm -hmm. Because here we are to talk about the arts of living and the, 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 the idea that art is a separate category of experience or a separate category of life, we, we try to do away with that. And so anyway, when I am listening to your uh, three uh, presentations, these ideas are swirling around in my head and I just wanted to send them back to you um, mm -hmm. to see what you uh, would think of them. So thank, it's more, I guess it's more of a comment than a question, but please, mm -hmm. if you would. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you, um, David. 
Thank you, Daniel. I have a sort of a similar place that I'm in as you in terms of I wish I had could spend a few days with the other speakers thinking more and more about where there's such strong continuity and where there might be things for little knots for us to untie and learn from each other. I, I was so struck by um, what seemed to me to be a deepening theme from a kind of immediate sort of shallow academic discussion on my part uh, into an into sort of the aesthetic encounter that then moved from from my perspective even deeper you know the image I mean I thought <clears throat> first of all I thought my talk was almost unnecessary and it was so interesting when I when I talk about this stuff oh, no. in the west it's always about resisting the use of art to promote knowledge right art has become a tool of informing and teaching and instructing and engaging the sort of hyper rational way in which we're trying to solve these problems and so it was so interesting for me to be on a panel with two uh, Japanese speakers coming from a Japanese perspective where that seemed not present at all in 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 both instances where there was drawing a relationship between art and sustainability and at no point was there ever any tendency to use the art in this kind of instrumental way that that I'm, you know, and so you know, somebody watching this panel might go, "What are you worried about? Like that's not that's not happening at all. There's no evidence of that at all." So it's partly like incredibly reassuring to me to see such uh, such a what I see as an authentic and genuine uh, uh, relationship with the aesthetic, and then to watch it go into that that idea of you know that sort of idea of art as a way of paying attention to the world. And the artists, the artists come in in Otasan's talk. The artists come about realizing the soil under his feet, of coming to that place. Uh, and then this character of Hoichi in the next talk of actually realizing the things beyond the soil, realizing the spirit behind the things, and and the sort of where, where the aesthetic contemplation can take you, even even be, even when your senses are are gone. That was I. So I feel like there's something rich there and I don't know how to put my, you can hear me struggling to put my finger on it. Um, so I just feel like I wish we had more time with each other to continue working on what, what I feel has come up in this panel. Thank you and uh, Ota-san. Hi. Ano... So for your comment, well, he actually in this symposium, our title is The Arts of Living with Nature. So art should be part of our daily lives. And through my experience in organizing this exhibition, I felt that uh, I was actually incorporating arts into my daily life. I became more sensitive to the changes of seasons. For example, I am more sensitive to, I become more sensitive to watching at the moon, how it changes, and also my sensitivity to nature became so rich after organizing this event. And I hope that an audience who visited the exhibition feel the same way. So in your day, daily living, that is something emitted from artworks. Maybe we can take in something that is emitted from artworks into your daily lives. And then that could lead to uh, the arts of living. Thank you, Ota-san and uh, Hirose-san. Thank you very much, and well, thank you very much, and um, we'll sum up all the uh, presentations. Now I, it becomes more clear uh, how 
our presentations are connected. So thank you very much. And uh, it's very difficult for me to give you a, a general comment, but I just want to share with you how I see arts. So in the beginning, so when I encounter a word of art, actually I studied in the US when I was a student and I wasn't good at speaking English, but then I the wish to communicate in some way. That's why I joined a you know, martial art club in the US. <laughs> so Budo is translated into martial art. So it's art and that is a kind of the encounter of myself to the broader definition of art. So art is maybe a way to live or a way to express. I think that's yeah, my experience of being exposed to the definition of art. And uh, well, I didn't really speak directly to the symposium theme, which is the, the arts of living with nature, but um, maybe through arts, uh, we might be able to connect how to live with nature on how to live naturally. Mm. I'm not really a specialist in arts, but um, when I organize an event together with our art college in Kyoto, I try to communicate how I see art to students. And so a RT from art, so purpose, effect, and means. So first, the purpose of arts is to be aware, to be a consciousness or to be conscious. So A represent awareness. And then effect of art is relationship. Through arts, you are able to relate to others. You can create a variety of type of relations. This is a one of the effects from arts. And also the as a or one of the way to uh, sense arts is touching. I think because those who are involved in arts, who create arts, they use their hands in one way or another. So once artworks are created by hands, they must be appreciated by, by touching by hands. Through that kind of experience, you are able to understand how the artists created arts. Of course, there are a lot of things we can't touch, but Touching could be a way to appreciate arts. You are able to and understand or appreciate art more by touching. So that is actually how I explain my definition of art to the students, ART. So I don't think that is, uh, you know, maybe um, as deep as you expect, but, uh, uh, you know, taking this opportunity, I wish to uh, more learn about arts going oh. forward. Thank you, Hirose-san. Uh, literally, we are touching the core of the, this symposium now. So we have seven minutes. So Frederick and Yamagiwa-san raise the hand. So Yamagiwa-san first and, and Frederick. Hi, thank you. Thank you. So in relation to the uh, topic of gardens, Hirose-san uh, said, uh, talked about the Vibanashi Hoichi, uh, the story, and uh, he said that uh, Hoichi lost his ears. And before that, the priest uh, wrote a sutra all over his body. And he talked about the two significance of writing the sutra all over his body. In the latter, uh, in relation to the latter, uh, it, without uh, ears and uh, vision, uh, people could uh, 
communicate. And I think uh, this is uh, similar uh, to the senses that uh, human beings are, are made to create something uh, by their plants. And uh, uh, the monkeys uh, communicate with plants. And uh, also the plants uh, communicate with uh, insects and animals and birds. Junji Takabayashi uh, works in a uh, uh, ecological center, and uh, he, he talks about how the uh, plants communicate with each other. The plants, when they are eaten by insects, uh, they send out a signal uh, to attract the insects, other insects, uh, the other animals that will eat the insects. So how does the plants uh, communicate with uh, insects? And uh, he does research on this communication between plants and insects. But actually, this does occur. It is a phenomenon that we see, that we see, that is the communication uh, between uh, plants and insects. So. And we do have the senses to feel this uh, communication between uh, the plants and insects. And that is the reason why we can live in nature. So the environment. People, humans, uh, prioritize language, words, and also uh, eyesight or views. But if we uh, take that away, we can feel something else. So uh, Hirose-san uh, focuses on tactile senses. And if he looks at the nature based upon tactile senses, he can sense something that you cannot see by your eyes. You can feel something that you cannot uh, see with your eyes. And that's very important. So in common sense, uh, we think that uh, gardens are something that uh, we view, we enjoy by viewing. I think there is uh, a trap in that. Uh, we need to find senses that we can communicate with the insects in the garden. I think this is something, this is the way we should appreciate uh, gardens. And so by losing words, art can uh, provide us with something different. That's my opinion. Thank you, Yamagiya san. Uh, it is broad and more broad uh, problem is uh, connected in this uh, to this discussion. So we have three minutes. Uh, so I will ask the all the three for each one minute and then some kind of quick end remarks. So that I would like to the order of this presentation. So from David Magus to Ota San and Hirose. So the, at first, please, David, the last, last remark for the present, uh, this symposium. Sure, and, 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 and then I'll also say thank you so much again for, for this and to the translators for helping me participate. Uh, thank you. I think one of the things that's emerging is just there's this idea of a spectrum <clears throat> where, and this again, maybe something that is very much particular to the West, but we take sustainability and writing our relationship with the natural world to be a challenge primarily of knowledge. And it's this quest to know things that, that we use as the sort of main way that we relate to this. And I feel like there's been this spectrum opened up in this, in this conversation that moves from that challenge to know things to the kind of qualities of attention that I was trying to identify uh, and the relationship that it has with these elements of the deep subjective, which I've found to be so strong in both the other presentations. Um, and then interesting issues around that being the mode of attention towards materiality, as Daniel was saying, this kind of, you know, the materiality yet at a distance, the sort of, um, the, 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 the soil and the things that were <laughs> you didn't want to touch because you didn't want to uh, mess them up, but obviously presented something very immediate there to the, to the themes that were in the, in the final talk that were moving almost to a level of immateriality uh, to beyond the material world uh, as to where that quality of attention might take us and what it means to, 
to be in 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 relationship with the natural world through the aesthetic not through information about it not through the kind of technical and managerial knowledge but through its patterns and its forms uh, and i think there's something really rich to be to be mined from the, the the intersections between these these discussions thank you and otasan Thank you very much. Listening to the presentations uh, by two other people and also by the, uh, the panelists, other panelists, uh, I was able to recognize the difference uh, between the uh, the Orient and the, the Western uh, ideas. And as uh, Hiroshi-san said, uh, uh, we are very visual dominated uh, in the modern world right now. and. Uh, However, we should be uh, able to make of other senses, for other senses more um, sensitive, and uh, art can play a very important uh, role in that. And uh, in terms of craftsmanship, I think uh, um, this is very much uh, related to my talk. Uh, the work of art of the two artists that I uh, introduced uh, was something that you could not really touch, but. Uh, these are the artists that uh, uh, use uh, their uh, full body uh, in order to express uh, themselves and to create their artwork. And uh, this is also conveyed to the, uh, the visitors as well. We also uh, showed the way uh, he created his exhibition, the artists ex uh, uh, created their exhibition uh, in the exhibition, and uh, also this bodily work is very important. And uh, I think this is a very uh, important matter uh, to live. Uh, and uh, I was able to emphasize that uh, once again, and we recognize that once again uh, through Hiroshi San's presentation. And what I heard uh, today, I think was very beneficial to think of the uh, future direction of the museum that I work for right now. Thank you. And Hiroshi-san. Yes, uh, I would like to keep it uh, short. Uh, uh, thank you for the comment, uh, uh, Professor Yamagiwa. Uh, and uh, so, uh, I was enlightened by the fact that uh, we should also uh, consider the communication with uh, plants. I think uh, I was able to broaden uh, my uh, view and my, my ideas once again. And uh, also, in relation to the discussion going forward, I would like to uh, provide a, a topic. Uh, there is a stone garden in uh, Ryoanji of Kyoto, which is uh, quite uh, famous, the stone garden. And uh, stone garden uh, is uh, to be considered as something to view. And we cannot touch the stones when we go to the gardens. However, for the uh, visual impaired people, uh, there is a miniature uh, stone garden displayed uh, in Yoanji. And uh, so uh, the students who come, they uh, touch the miniature and the sands and the stones are uh, precisely located uh, uh, to replicate the, the stone garden. And of course, the objective of this is for the visually impaired. And when I touch uh, these uh, miniature stones, uh, stone garden, I feel like uh, I have become a gardener. There's a stone here, there's a stone there, there's a stone here. And as I touch the stones, uh, I feel like I am uh, positioning the stones and I feel like I have become a gardener. So I think uh, this is a sense that you can enjoy uh, by, only touching and not just looking at the stone garden. So uh, to the people who visit uh, Ryoanji going forward, uh, please uh, try to touch this uh, stone garden for the visually impaired because you can really touch it. And this is a different way of appreciating the garden. Thank you very much. Uh, he was assigned all of the three. We have a very dense discussion and it will continue to the next uh, session, the uh, public session. So thank you very much, all three. And uh, the, I would like to ask, uh, say that the next session will uh, 
begin 1915 in Japan time, uh, uh, tw 12 minutes later. So see you again and thank you again for those three. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and good afternoon and good morning. This is the Ring 16th International Symposium, The Arts of Living with Nature, and this is day four. So, in this session, we will look into the power of arts getting a little bit outside of garden. We will have a discussion among three speakers with totally different backgrounds. We have 90 minutes and for um, the first 30 minutes, each speaker will give a presentation, 10 minutes each. Then we will have general discussion and the maybe remaining 20 minutes, we will take up questions and comments from the audience as well. So let's begin with a, a further ado. Think Japanese know gagaku, but maybe even Japanese do not understand what actually gagaku means. So the first speaker is, how can I call him? a player of Gagaku, um, Ono-san, Mr. Ono. Maybe I will call him Ono-san. So I'd like to ask Ono-san to explain what Gagaku is. Even Japanese do not know it. So would you please start your talk? Thank you for the introduction. My name is uh, Ono Shindyu. I am a, a player of gagaku or performer of gagaku. Court music uh, would be the uh, explanation or translation of uh, gagaku. However, it has a very uh, complex uh, background and history. Uh, so not uh, in court, uh, but uh, and uh, also not only in the Shintoism, uh, it is uh, very much related to Buddhism as well. Shtennoji, uh, which is a, a temple uh, created, uh, established by Shotoku Taishi uh, in Osaka, uh, has set up an uh, orchestra, and we call it a Tennoji Gakso. Uh, it has uh, a history of 1,400 years. And so uh, there is a organization called uh, Garyokai, which inherits uh, this uh, gakso of Tennoji. And I am the vice uh, uh, president of uh, this uh, Garyokai. And uh, I am not just a uh, president, a director, uh, but uh, I also perform. Uh, and so I would like to share with you my PowerPoint. Gagaku, art of communing with nature as a sacred uh, transcend transcendence. This is my title uh, in Japanese too. Uh, Gagaku, art of communing with uh, nature as a sacred transcendence. This is the title of my talk today. And so uh, I play uh, Bugaku dance and Gagaku uh, in the uh, garden of uh, Tennoji, and I also uh, perform as a dancer as well. And so, so uh, Gariokai uh, inherits uh, uh, this Shoryo-e, uh, and uh, it is uh, uh, designated as the uh, national treasure as well. Uh, and uh, also, I have been uh, involved uh, in the uh, study of uh, uh, religion. Uh, I am also a religious scholar uh, who studied at Kyoto University, and I am a visiting professor at the Kansai University. And I am also a priest of uh, Judo or 
Jodo Shinshu sect of uh, Buddhism in a temple called Gansenji. So, uh, with this background, I would like to talk about Gagaku, art of a communing with uh, nature as a sacred uh, transcendence. The arts of living with nature uh, is the uh, uh, topic of this symposium. And the first I would like to explain the characteristics of Gagaku. Uh, gagaku is the Japan's oldest performing art. In Japan, we have no and kabuki. Uh, they are uh, traditional performance uh, in Japan too. But gagaku is quite different from no and kabuki. That is, uh, with regard to uh, no and gabu kabuki, our art that emerged from the people and was subsequently refined to become a traditional art form. However, gagaku was a, a completed uh, uh, source music and uh, instruments in style and musical theory uh, that was uh, transported uh, to Japan from the Tang Dynasty of China. So this is the uh, greatest difference uh, between gagaku and other traditional uh, performing arts. So it is the oldest uh, performing arts. Uh, therefore, uh, with regard to music, logic, and style, and uh, also uh, source of music and instruments, uh, gagaku has uh, provided a uh, lots of impact. and. Uh, Gagaku's uh, music piece uh, and sceneries are uh, being reflected in various uh, uh, performing arts uh, of others in Japan. Uh, in terms of the number of instruments and the precision of the uh, music theory is very refined and they are unrivaled by other traditional Japanese performing arts. Therefore, we can say that uh, Gagaku is truly an ancient uh, orchestra. We have eight uh, different types of instruments uh, in which we play as an ensemble. So, as I have said, it is truly an ancient orchestra. Further on, um, so Gagaku is uh, based upon a imported music, and uh, this was promoted by uh, Shotoku uh, Taishi, and uh, uh, it has been positioned as a Japanese religious uh, uh, rituals as the art uh, that connects humans with uh, God and Buddha. But uh, uh, we uh, did not take away uh, the Shintoism, and uh, uh, we have all, uh, also uh, kept the Shintoism and Buddhism. So we have uh, created uh, uh, this uh, Shinto Buddhist uh, syncretism. And uh, uh, in this uh, Shinto Buddhism syncretism in the Heian period, Heian period, uh, uh, Gagaku was. Uh, uh, played and uh, so the noble people, uh, based upon the religious belief and as sense of aesthetic, uh, gagaku has been developed uh, as a, uh, a ritual uh, art performing performing art, and since then it has not changed. So uh, in uh, Buddhist uh, rituals and also in Shinto uh, rituals, gagaku has been played uh, since then. So, it's not uh, a quite a uh, uh, fusion of Shintoism and Buddhism in Japan, but uh, uh, it has been uh, closely linked. And so Shinto uh, Buddhist uh, syncretism was established and Gagaku is played in both uh, Buddhist uh, ceremonies and Shinto rituals uh, for the uh, past uh, 1200 years. Uh, when gagaku is uh, played, the sacred people move, and uh, after the sacred people move, 
the gagaku stops and the dance uh, uh, starts once again and offering uh, starts once again. So uh, it gagaku is a part of the uh, ceremonies and rituals and gagaku is uh, indispensable in uh, ceremonies and rituals. So for 1200 years, gagaku has been used in Japanese religious rituals as an art that connects humans with gods and Buddha. So uh, the basis of uh, Shinto Buddhism uh, syncretism, there is the sacred uh, nature uh, and uh, a reverence to the sacred uh, nature. So uh, whether it may be uh, Buddhist uh, ceremonies or Shinto rituals, uh, gagaku and uh, bugaku dance are performed uh, outside uh, in the nature, outdoors in the nature. And uh, so uh, gagaku uh, is uh, played uh, outdoors in the nature. In other words, uh, uh, gagaku uh, is a way uh, to commune with nature uh, as a transcendent. So, uh, Japanese temples and shrines, shrines are built on natural sites that are thought to hold sacred power as a circuit to interact with the power while making its uh, presence uh, explicit. So gagaku uh, in temples and shrines, it is an art to commune with nature. So this uh, sacred uh, uh, power of nature is ambivalent. Uh, uh, it is not always uh, uh, blessings for human beings. Sometimes it can uh, be a wild spirit with rage. Uh, therefore, it is not a target for uh, management or uh, it is not something that is being managed. Uh, therefore, gagaku uh, was meant to invoke the sacred power uh, to make offerings and what is uh, very important is to have the spirit uh, return and be pacified. And uh, that is the significance of gagaku that is uh, being performed uh, outside uh, in nature. So gagaku uh, is an important clue to examine the Japanese uh, people's religious consciousness and the way they live or the way we live with nature as a transcendence. This is uh, my intuitive uh, recognition of gagaku. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I thought that gagaku was something uh, quite far from nature, but I found uh, it to be opposite. Uh, it is a, a art uh, to uh, commune with nature and also uh, it is uh, uh, art uh, to uh, uh, live with nature as transcendence. Next, Hasegawa-san. Yuko Hasegawa is director of the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Arts in Kanazawa and also professor of Graduate School of Global Arts, Tokyo University of the Arts. We ask her to talk about the curation and we have listened to the presentation made by a curator already before in academic session by uh, Ms. Ota. And also we had a speaker uh, like uh, David talk about art, but then like as Kasekao said, talk about what curation is. Hello, everyone. This is Hasegawa. I am director of the 21st Century Museum of Contemporary Arts. And um, I teach a global curation and theory at the um, Tokyo University of the Arts. And if you look at my bio, I and has been, well, I am an expert in the contemporary art. But now the definition of contemporary arts is expanding. That's now um, contain the um, environmental wishes and many artists create their artistic works through the understanding of society um, or environmental issues. 
and arts is now a crossroad of different disciplines. It's really a, a multidisciplinary. And then curation and also is one of my a expertise as well, in addition to the writing uh, theories of papers and others. So I would like to move on to my slide. すみません、ならないわ。あ、だった。はい。で、えっと、全体に行くのどれでしたっけ um, first, I'd like to explain what an, a work of art is. He, through our discussion that we have already, he have discussed a lot about the artworks through the framework of, of our words or others. And uh, when I ask, was asked to talk about nature, actually, human beings are part of nature and also artworks which are produced by human beings are part of nature as well. Therefore, how I see nature, um, I was thinking how I see the nature for the preparation of this talk. Actually, we are part of nature. So being part of nature, how we know the world and how we feel in on nature and how we translate and interpret that into something that can be shared with others. Those are, I think, an art, a skilled uh, waza or technique. So the arts, natural environment and well, the, the art I'm talking about is not in the sense of the uh, natural environment, but actually art itself is part of nature. That is how I see art in relation with nature. So the work of art is a, a medium, um, a thing made manifest and given form through political perspectives, interpretation and imaginings of world events. So it is a thing made manifest. So if you think about a thing, that maybe sounds like something that is uh, like a substance material, but it could be anything. So that could be a different uh, forms, uh, visuals or scent or whatever. So if you have a form that can be shared with others, that is what uh, our artwork means. So in my uh, expertise, that is curation, what curation is. Let me try to explain it. I believe the uh, curation create a relational value. So their materials, artworks and data and artifacts, but through the framework of exhibition, we put them into a frame and then create a world view, present and form to see the world. And in this activity, uh, they are uh, sensory learning through different senses. And also it leads to the knowledge production and also provide opportunity to know the world. That is what the curator, uh, uh, curation practice is. So this is the, you know, how I see the curation. So by collecting artworks, then curator actually create uh, the world of view to see those artworks. So it's require 
the act of interpretation and also the audience take it as in their own way so when it comes to interpretation there are different types of interpretation interpretation of curator and also interpretation by audience so, as I mentioned about the relational value, so why a sensory, a sensory learning is important. And if you look at the event, well, it, that is a rather human centric, it's a logo centric, it's a Western centric, it's basically segmented by information. That is the uh, that's actually pose uh, to uh, pose a limit to our worldview in a contemporary way. Therefore, we need to really see it as an chaos to overcome this limit. So why art is necessary? In Anthropocene, so what is called Anthropocene, uh, given this situation, we uh, really are lost. So human beings are lost faced with the, uh, this age of Anthropocene. And many uh, theorists say that art is to show the vision for the future or art is a solution. But I'm um, rather thinking in that way, I believe art is something that is running together with the current situation. So art contains um, various meanings and it's create a chemical reaction. Art is a place of experiment, which proposes a new way of looking at things and that is being interpreted, interpreted in different ways by the audience. So it's, it's basically a place of accident or coincidence. So art uh, goes out the uh, logos or text space. So it's uh, create a metaphor, allegory, a new narrative to create a new the, the resonation with the object, the a new resonance with this object that is the world. So rather than making a human and various forms of humanity object of knowledge and art be the bearer of an intellectual revolution to make it one among many living things, one false among many. So as we have already heard, it's also relation between human and non-human and also in order to interaction that then as a means of establishing solidarity and tracing correlation arts two elements of translation and interpretation and the generation of empathy play an important role so transsensory and how to see complex things how to appreciate that and also, the language of art is not only audible, it's not only visual, it's not also include audible, sometimes other sensory language. So um, artists generally translate and interpret various events in the world into various sensory language. That is very important. And when it comes to empathy, the word empathy, and has been mentioned many times in the last couple of days, empathy could take place or may be between non-humans and non-humans, as we have heard. And then when it comes to compassion, whether compassion is only for human beings, so from the phenomenological perspective, more like a materialistic analysis, or can create an advanced place for the empathy. So they are tried in different ways. 
So meaning that connection with the world, connection with others, how they can be recovered, and in order to reconnect how arts are being used in different ways. So I'd like to show you some of the examples. And the power of the objects. So please look at this. So seeing is believing. This is uh, on Oliver Ellison, the work of the Glacier Mail series. So Greenland, the glacier is receding. This is changing in 20 years. So he threw the aesthetic comparison and he showed 20 different pictures of a glacier which is being melt and this is another one this is the uh, mesocosm so mesocosm is a term from environmental science meaning a slice of an ecosystem that one has isolated in order to study the marina zirko looking at 140 hours to see a ecosystem in texas so the location called a wink and the sink is created in this location by digging for oil and then by using algorithm he created something that is always changing and then how to deal with something invisible so this is in a sense hyper objective the network that surround us and also in the transactions for example this one is a transaction of bitcoins which is visualized in this artwork we can't see it by our own eyes but um, by having this kind of visualization of blockchains we are able to understand the block um, for the source of uh, source of um, trustworthiness of the transaction that promote understanding of how Bitcoin is being used in the transactions. So there are a lot of works like this one. And this is another one. I have been to Brazil many times to do the research. And this is a artwork which is called the Huni Kunlun. Artists are involved in indigenous people. And this is a picture created by Huni Kunlun. Although they didn't have any culture to draw paintings, but uh, they were asked to create these kind of paintings by an anthropologist and their picture shows that how they transform into animals and how uh, those animals are being seen by themselves and this is a particular example natalia bazoska she is the psychiatrist and she encountered with a wild wolf and she uh, started to have communication with a wild wolf which is who is called a luna and she spent many times with luna the wild uh, wolf and she started to create something hybrid between animal and human being and on the other day uh, there was a discussion about the um, environment or conditions being shared when human beings contact with um, wild animals so this is another one this is by a pierre uic so monkey wear the mask and we had uniforms like this one. Somebody who works in our bar in Fukushima, well, the monkey uh, used to work in a, a bar in Fukushima prefecture, but due to the disaster in Fukushima, 
basically the, the monkey uh, didn't work uh, because of the disaster, but then this is a reproduction of the monkey, how he uh, monkey work without human being. It shows a desire or motivation and also what he wants to achieve that is being depicted in this artwork. And this is by David Onlai. So we have heard about the Eskio, the Undwelt, but and this is related to that. And this is by Stefano Mancuso on botanist in France. So the plant have the intelligence and uh, this is a collaboration with the scientists and artists and shows how plants carry intelligence. So on the right hand side, inside a glass cases, by having a right arrangement, um, by having a right arrangement of plants, that an air actually being purified inside the glass. So it's basically paying attention to the function and ability of plants and intelligence. So these are the examples I wanted to show. And I hope um, these uh, can, be a source, can be a source for your discussion later on. Yeah, thank you very much, Hosegawa-san. Thank you very much for sharing some of the concept. It can be expanded later in our discussion. So like uh, medium, translation, and those are very important words, and also empathy, whether the empathy is compassion, whether they are interchangeable, and there are many points to be discussed later. So thank you very much. And uh, also, you said art is not something that solves the uh, problem, but art is actually working together with the, the world that is changing. So art goes with changing world. That is how you explain about an art. So thank you very much. And also, Ono-san, you explain about Gagaku. Gagaku has been there for over 1,200 1, years without any change. That is very interesting contrast. So, Institute for Advanced Sustainability Studies uh, at uh, Potsdam, uh, Germany, uh, is uh, where Ilan Char Chabe uh, does research at. Uh, so uh, he belongs to IISH. And uh, one word about him, Iran yeah. used to be a physicist. Yeah. So that's uh, one I think that I'd like to uh, say about him. So I will give you 15 minutes. Uh, I don't think 10 minutes would be enough for you. So go ahead, please, uh, Ilan. Thank you very much. And thank you all for the marvelous opportunity to learn with all of you from the previous session that I heard and this session, the two speakers already have really enriched my understanding of art and certainly my uh, knowledge of and sense of gagaku, which I encountered when I was 16 years old in the first visit to Japan with my father who was sing a singer and uh, met several Japanese artists and musicians after he sang with the NHK symphony in Tokyo. And so I was introduced to the idea of gagaku with very little knowledge, but at least introduced to it uh, from quite some time ago. I Let me just sort of preface everything I'm going to say by saying that I, I grew up fortunately surrounded by artists. My father was a singer all over the world, um, by scientists, by philosophers, by people who loved music, who were in our house all the time. So I grew up with this wonderful mixture of art, science, thinking, ideas. And it really, and, and I also grew up in, in cities in 
the mountains and forest, different places that we live. Um, so it really nurtured a deep curiosity about the world around me. And throughout my life, first as a natural scientist and then migrating into social science and humanities, um, I've never really separated things very clearly into this discipline and that discipline or this way of looking at the world or another, rather trying to see it and, and do see it quite holistically. So let me share my screen and begin the presentation. And there we go. Hopefully that's visible. Um, let me just move this so that I don't have a problem. There we go. Um, so what I wanna talk about is sort of art, science and nature and this very generic sense of making sense of data. And particularly I'm interested in the question of how we move towards sustainable futures. Uh, let's see, wait a minute. I'm not, okay. Um, first of all, just a reflection on how I see nature and uh, nature as a concept, not a thing, but a concept that humans construct that encompasses the entire complex social, ecological, economic, technological system in which we hum humans are an integral part, an inseparable part of that nature. We're not separate from it where we're here and nature is there. We are part of it and we shape it and it shapes us. What's important in this and where I use the term data, not in a narrow technical sense, but the sense that we continually receive and process sensory data from our biophysical environment through our five senses um, and also social data from the social societal environment, the milieu that we live in and the people that we interact with. So thinking about art and science is a question of making sense. And again, using senses and making sense or learning or interpreting. And the word interpretation for me is an important one. We interpret not only direct and other senses and what I mean by augmented sensory data is that we have telescopes, we have microscopes, we have ways of amplifying sound. We have the Zoom meeting that allows us to engage our senses in different ways. But we also have a whole set of social cultural data that's really at the core of both art and science. There is a commonality. And in particular, art, science, philosophy, belief systems, help us make sense of our existence, to give meaning to it. And in doing so, they guide our choices and our pathways as we live in nature. It, they are always therefore also normative and not fundamentally objective, including the science, which is somewhat counter to the view that many have in natural science in particular, that says, oh, we are after the objective truth. Well, actually not, because there are a whole set of normative decisions made in terms of who is funding such research, for whom is it beneficial, for whom is it harmful, and who makes use of it, and who is it not even aware of it. So it leads to contested knowledge and conflicts, unfortunately, as we see all too often. <clears throat> Excuse me. Science and technology, just to 
add to that, it, as I mentioned in terms of augmented sensory data, <clears throat> it expands our capabilities for living with nature, living in nature. And it allows us for better and worse to alter the environment or build new ones entirely around us. Indeed, to we move from Earth to the moon and perhaps to Mars, but that means it also increases resource demand, which is already approaching limits and as in the planetary boundaries argument. It also leads to innovation. Great, that's a good thing sometimes, but in the complex system in which we don't know where all the moving pieces are, that is that something initiated at one time and place here can have an impact microseconds later somewhere else, or perhaps a century later, it has an impact. So we don't know where, what all the consequences are, and that leads to these unintended consequences, some positive emergent properties that we actually learn from, benefit from, and many very much negative and problematic. A little bit on culture. As I said, we, we continually receive and process social data from our uh, social cultural milieu. That is, we know what, what's kind of expected of us, what clothes should we wear today, um, how do we address each other, et cetera. So they're, they're norms, they're also narratives, they're rituals. We just heard very in very beautiful images also about the gagaku as ritual and the meaning of that. And it deals with the artifacts that are created. So these, this data may be created as artifacts or they may evolve through cultural practice in terms of these rituals, norms, narratives. And humans have always used art to express these narratives, what, going all the way back to the, some of the earliest images we have on cave walls that depicted certain events, but they are also narrative in the sense that there is a choice made as to what they depict and what those might signify for the people who created them and the group they were part of. So they've always been a form of human communication. Let me say a little more about narratives per se. What I find important in them is that they are purposeful and they are affective. That is that they are not simply a transmission of information or just a story. They may contain stories and generally they, they have a story attached to them or they are derived from. But the point is that they have a reason to exist as such and they are emotionally powerful in different ways. One of the questions is powerful for whom? But more importantly, they're really an interface to the normative landscape of context and culture that I mentioned just earlier. And they use, as I said, these emotionally powerful expressions to engage in that landscape of culture and context, in which are very different and which have different symbols, different reference points in different cultures and different um, environments in which those cultures exist. One of the functions that, that it has, the narratives have, are the idea of maintaining the cultural identity. They're ways of reminding us that we are part of this culture, of this community, this group, whatever that is. So clearly seeing the gagaku, the, the um, dances, seeing no performances, all of those um, are ways also of, of both reminding us 
of the culture and the history of it, but also of connecting to each other through that medium, through that ritual. And the, it is important because it, it reflects both a vision of society, a reflection in the, if, if you will, of the present or past or future of the society, and it reflects social identities. Who are we in that community? We, we all walk around with multiple identities. We are parts of a club. We are parts of a religious organization. We're part of a university or a school group. We're part of the family, et cetera. These are our identities and they uh, often we are aware of multiple identities and make choices as to which identity in a sense we're wearing at any given time. Margaret Summers makes a comment which often has stuck with me uh, in a, a book and a paper from the 1990s um, that to, not to act according to this social identity would be to deny who you are in that context. And so we avoid that. But the other important piece here is that when these are aligned, that is the vision of, a, of society or group and the social identity, when these are coincident, if you will, they reinforce one another, then people who are in the group and are recognized as being in the group and recognize themselves as being in the group are more likely to support community decisions. That leads to a sense of collective agency that strengthens the individual sense of agency. And there also comes a point that David Maggs made in the earlier section about agency and leverage. And it is that increasing that leverage through collective agency that may be important. It also is an, a way of expressing perceived causes, and they may not be really causes, but correlations of chronic and acute disruptive stress that are the basis for many expressions of blame, of misinformation, of xenophobia, of racial bias, because it's a question of, are you the in-group or are you the out-group? Do you belong or do you not? And so the narratives play an important role in expressing that and in coding, in a sense, our responses. Some quick examples, um, in this case from an indigenous community township in Taiwan, after a landslide in 2009, destroyed um, several villages th from three different tribes and also their uh, agricultural lands. And there was this marvelous um, mural that this artist that you can sort of see, let's see, um, standing in the background here, uh, he painted this around his home uh, as a way of mem memorializing the lost township and the heritage of culture that that represented. What was done was that three communities joined a fourth that were invited by a fourth and they became a larger community and the public space contains this sculpture, if you are bas relief um, in the community gathering space that is, if you will, a narrative of the tribes living together. And two other powerful, one very well-known, one perhaps less known um, here is Picasso's um, mural and one of Harriet Tubman and freeing slaves in the Civil War as opposed in the Spanish Civil War. Moving on very quickly, there are also symbols as the camphor tree in um, Higashi Miyoshi 
and the community dialogue that I was privileged to, en to engage in that was creating a vision for the future of this community in Chizu, uh, where I visited with Norio Okada. So I think narratives in not only in, in traditional media, but in digital media are now becoming very important. And the question one might ask is what makes these narratives sticky, powerful, or what is it doesn't make them work in certain groups? And how do we capture those dynamics and intentions and identities? And one approach that we are taking is creating a digital observatory of narratives of sustainability, DONS were acronym, in Classica 2.0, which very briefly I will jump through. With, Classica is something I started in 2008 and has been working in many ways with um, RIN over the last uh, 10 years, certainly. Um, and the idea is to look at collective behavior change and look at these narratives of vision identity and ultimately to find and support ways to just and equitable futures. I'm gonna skip that and just briefly mention that many talks with Abe Sensei and Daniel Niles on learning and art, the, um, the ILEC project with Tetsu Sato and the book that grew out of that and the Feast project have all in some sense touched on or been influenced by this whole idea of the Classica thing. So let me, again, just quickly, the complex system idea of nature to make sense of data, the art science humanities to help us interpret narratives, the digital observatory, and I welcome you to join in this. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Ivan san. Um, in day four, we have heard for the first time about data. So if you hear data, you have a very simplistic understanding usually, but actually data has a profound meanings in it. That's what I learned. We have about 40 minutes. So there are a lot of things we can discuss. All of those uh, looks very um, tasty or delicious. So I think um, we have Ono-san, and this is a great opportunity to understand Gagaku. So maybe you can go a little bit deeper about Gagaku. So you mentioned about the sacred transcendent um, that is old Gagaku is about um, that he mentioned. Are there any questions regarding Gagaku, Hasegawa-san? Or yeah, yeah, please go ahead, Hasegawa-san. Hello, can I? Yeah. First of all, Nosan, thank you very much for your explanation regarding Gagaku. I have some exchange with people who are involved in Gagaku at my university. So basically, Gagaku, yeah, since 1990s in a field recording, there's a lot of activity to take in natural sound well, into the performance. But when it comes to Gagaku, you mentioned that nature is incorporated into the performance. On how do you actually um, make it happen? And also, would you please explain about the uh, costumes as well? Thank you very much. Uh, so, the regarding a grammar to take in nature into Gagaku, I have never have a look at look at that in that way. But one example I can explain <laughs> is that. Um, uh, there is a song called uh, Ranjo, so it requires uh, the Japanese flute and drums and all, all of those on a percussion instrument. And then 
we uh, they play the same phrase yeah a bit of delay for each instrument and uh, it's not really in harmonized it's create a kind of noise so it doesn't sound like the music in the western sense of the music and then you have a drums from time to time this is a uh, actually music which is played when god appears in performance for example something sacred appears this music is played so in nature sometimes you hear the sound of nature for example sound from the forest actually ancient people we near the sounds of and forest are secret but maybe you notice something from the sound of the forest that is something sacred sometimes and then in this music that this song is played when the god appeared in the drama performance so this is one way to connect or interconnect with or incorporate nature into the music of gagaku and also the costumes well those came from china most of them came from china those are very gorgeous of course uh, they are a little bit of adjustment after they came to japan uh, came to japan so iran san do you have any question concerning Gagaku or to Ono-san? I, I do indeed. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for a, a very beautiful um, presentation about your work and, and Gagaku. One question, which at least is my understanding and perhaps is not correct, Gagaku and, and, the, and no, for example, were very much part of the noble class and were presented as such. Do you see that that, in a sense, has become more broadly um, accepted or, or interested from the broader audience? I mean, that, that has that changed in terms of the both respect but appreciation, maybe? of people you know now and over the last century particularly hi i know meiji jidai uh, thank you very much for your question after the meiji there was a great change after the modernization time in japan up until meiji before the modernization of Japan, Gagaku was not allowed for commoners to perform. Therefore, it was not being appreciated by commoners. There were only limited occasions where commoners can observe Gagaku. But after the Meiji era, actually Gagaku was open open up to the commoners and also concert halls halls uh, uh, were now you know established and nowadays you know people see a concert hall is a place where gagaku is uh, played or performed that is one of the example of the popularization of gagaku but since the uh, Meiji period, yeah, Gagaku is much more popularized and it has a wider access from the uh, people's perspective. And as Hasegawa, uh, Dr. Hasegawa said uh, in the University of Art of Tokyo, well, there is a department that focuses on Gagaku and they have a lay Gakusha this is a highly skilled gagaku performing group and they also make a lot of new uh, challenges for example they try to be a bridge between western music and gagaku 
So it's about the curation of gagaku. They are very good at curating gagaku to make it more accessible. And no is rather belong to the samurai um, class up until Edo period. And no was only for noble people, as well as the samurai warrior class. But after Meiji period, even there are some difficulty or challenges, but the no was also introduced to um, general people, general public. And now, no, all the many new um, a, a work of no are being produced nowadays. Therefore, for the contemporary Japanese, it's quite easy to access to know as well. So situation is very different. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. About narrative, uh, Iran -san narrative. And also Iran San explained about the narrative. That is very important word to think about. So in Gagak, do you find narrative, especially if you take a word of Hasegawa san, is art is basically uh, working together with changing world. That's how she mm -hmm. sees our art. So I think a narrative is could be found could be found in Gagaku. So to the transformation, what what does the Gagaku play for the transformation of the world? So Gagaku has not been changed for 1,200 years. No, it's also um, has been kept intact in a core sense of no, or core part of a no has not been changed. And both the Gagaku and no Gaku are called Shikigaku, those are music for the rituals. Mm -hmm. So therefore they are different compared to um, Kabuki. Um, well, Kabuki is more like a popular performance, so, but the Gagaku and no Gaku are basically the ritual music. And as I explained already, Gagaku is for the ritual for gods, and then it's actually part of ritual. And no gaku is also part of shikigaku in the uh, samurai class. Well, if you have a, a load, if the, there's any an assignment of new a load, for example, there was some kind of ceremony, and then in that ceremony, no was performed to celebrate new um, enthronement appointment to a higher position among the samurai uh, class. So no was also part of the ceremony. And uh, also no was also reflected upon the religion, uh, syncretic of the uh, Buddhism and Shinto. So they are very similar. So in our case, uh, when we perform, uh, there are audiences, audience and performers, but somewhere there are uh, Buddha and the gods. And so in that place, uh, we feel the existence of gods and Buddha. So Buddha and gods uh, support uh, this uh, site for performance. S a narrative uh, as a myth and uh, also narrative uh, in the Buddhism, I think uh, is uh, are included. So, so even uh, as time as time passes, uh, the human uh, changes, and uh, I think uh, there is a way of understanding it as an art to respond to the changing uh, human. But at the same time, uh, Gagaku always uh, is conscious uh, of the narrative of the gods and Buddha. Uh, I think that is a part of the role of Gagaku. And in case of Japan, uh, this has uh, continued for 1,200 years. 
And uh, according to uh, my uh, understanding, I think that uh, the Japanese uh, society could not abandon, abandon, uh, could not abandon the uh, narratives of gods and Buddha. And I think uh, the core of that is the existence of uh, uh, the emperor. And so I think that that would be my response to the question by Ilan. Thank you very much. Uh, I know that there are many other people who would like to uh, raise their questions. So, uh, Yama Giwa-san, please. Thank you very much. Uh, with regard to a narrative, I think the narrative, the word narrative is the key word. And so I would like to uh, ask uh, uh, Ilan. Uh, so uh, looking back at the history of human beings, uh, the emergence of tools, the stone tools uh, emerged initially. Is this narrative, is every art narrative? is the question that I would like to ask you. I would like to ask the same question to Hasegawa-san. Uh, art and tools or uh, craft, uh, can they be uh, differentiated? And if so, what was the turning point of the differentiation between the two? So first, uh, Ilan, could you respond to the question from uh, Yamagiwa-sensei? Thank you, Yamagiwa-sensei. A very interesting question, and I think a very helpful one. Um, I think that that tools by themselves are not narratives, but the process of learning and incorporating tool making into the culture involves a narrative or could involve a narrative. And I know that in many societies, the the process of being an, a, an apprentice, for example, of learning from a master is not a narrative in some sense of being written down or whatever, but it is passing on a process. It is a way of encapsulating the knowledge that is part of that community. And in that broader sense, I could think of it as a narrative. What's, what I find interesting, and I would love to talk with you about when we can sit down together, is, is that true also, for example, in ape communities? Because there is tool making, tool use. And does that become culture by, by the nature of passing that down? Is that a parallel? Um, I mean, that's a, a question I have. Um, but I think that, that the broad sense is that the tools, um, if you will, are, are indications of a pattern in the culture, which may also be accompanied by a narrative to inform, instruct, carry on that tradition. Hi, Yamagasa, so Yamagiwa sensei, please, could you respond? So I would like to respond in Japanese with regard to monkeys and apes and chimpanzees. Uh, they do use uh, tools and when a new behavior, a new way of using tool emerges, this is inherited. It is being inherited to the next generation. But what is different uh, in Japan is that uh, it is not accumulated and it is not changed. In case of human beings, uh, tools were inherited as is, uh, but uh, from sometimes uh, new ideas, new um, ideas were added uh, as an innovation. And, uh, but uh, until then, uh, there were no accumulation. And that's the same with apes. So, uh, so in case of apes, uh, uh, the way of using tools inherited, uh, but there is no new ad, no new things added, but uh, uh, when new things are added, this is the, the characteristic of modern human beings. And uh, so uh, the way of using uh, tools are inherited in case of apes and monkeys and chimpanzees. So question from Yamagiwa-san to Hasegawa-san was raised, and could you respond? So uh, we're talking about the tools, yes. Whether tools are art. So my question was, 
how do you differentiate uh, tools and art? By using tools, uh, form is created, so tools are not art. It is a tool. It is a tool. It is a method. So uh, tools are not art. When I say uh, tools, uh, uh, I'm not talking about hammers. Uh, I am talking about hammers, and like hammers can be a, an art, can it not? For example, uh, stone tools have changed its form and it has become a decoration. I think this is a part of the history. So uh, the stone uh, was used to cut something and it was a tool, but gradually it became something that you appreciate. So I think uh, uh, stone tools uh, were shifted from being just a tool to an art. Now I understand what you're talking about. So in Kanazawa, uh, craftsmanship uh, is uh, uh, very much uh, uh, prosperous. And uh, so, so decoration and function, I think there are two separate uh, ideas. So what is decoration for and what is function for? Uh, I think uh, there is such a question and concept. Tools. Um, are used as an object but uh, when decoration and function come together we do not use the word tools any longer i think uh, that is my concept of art thank you so frederick i think uh, needs to say something frederick please please yes 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 i'm here thank you very much it's very interesting interesting debate and as um a tool user and a student of chimpanzee behavior, I was very pleased to see this question and Yamagiwa answer. Uh, I just want to, to add uh, just an element of uh, reflection because some of my colleagues observe uh, with chimpanzees uh, non-useful objects used and made by chimpanzee. For example, a necklace used by a female chimpanzee and she wore it. And we have different examples of use of feathers by chimpanzee in Bosu, described by Japanese colleagues also. So there is some meanings of objects outside a, um, a direct use, full uh, usage of, of, of tool for food or for defensive uh, activities. And uh, we only find that with Homo erectus, uh, what uh, Yamagiwa Sensei developed, uh, we only find that with Homo erectus, who choose uh, some biphases, indexes uh, with colors and ochre used, made on um, a tool who is not used as a tool, but as used uh, as a symbol, as an icon. So only recently in, your, in, your, in the history of human beings, we can find such things. But I've got some two, two questions, if a brief question to, um, to Ilan Shabai and to uh, Yuko Asegawa. Uh, one uh, to Asegawa, it's uh, about uh, Mancuso um, uh, work uh, and uh, uh, Stefano Mancuso uh, is uh, one of the leaders in plant intelligence. Uh, and uh, his way to present uh, plants is very interesting and the knowledge uh, behind is interesting, but it's not in an artistic way. So I would like very much to, to have your mind on where, what is the difference between science um, vulgarization and um, art presentation of uh, a similar uh, uh, knowledge uh, about um, plant uh, uh, transmission. And for Ilan Shabai, my, my question is very short too. Uh, it's, uh, it's about, in fact, it's about desire. Um, last month, Bruno Latour wrote a, a small book. Just ask Kasegawa and answer your question. Then maybe you can raise the question later for Iran. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, yeah. please. Thank you very much for your question, Frederick. I met uh, Vancudo 
after re reading a book. And when I met the monkeys or Kakuzo as a curator, he welcomed me a lot. And so collaboration with the artist, collaboration with architect and designer. So he was, uh, he has such kind of expectations. And Mankeso Kudo has done a lot of experiment and wrote the paper a lot, but um, which didn't change the world. So he was a little bit frustrated by the fact that he couldn't change the world. And then the work that I showed you is a collaboration with the uh, Dutch visual artist. So the function and the intelligent work of the plants, and that is something to emotion that Chavaisa mentioned, and also sensitivity. So that could be a, a narrative as a broad sense to communicate to us. So the transformation of art by adding some aesthetic sense mm -hmm. that can evoke and have an impact on our senses, like visual impact and other impact on our senses that could lead to the awareness of human beings. So for Van Kuzo, and this type of artwork is very important. Of course, scientists, by having a data visualization for their presentation, but collaboration with artists, artists and sensitivity, uh, now there are some additional elements, interpretation of artists and also aesthetic sense of interpretations added into these artworks. And as for AI, AI factory, it's a collaboration between graphic designer and an architect. Yeah, that's all. And also, I was so impressed by what Chai said, the word of data, a word, well, the data has a really carries a lot of different meanings. So I really appreciate. So that gives me a new understanding of data. So maybe through collaboration with artists, um, we can be able to communicate in a better way that could create a narrative that could be shared as a culture. So by using a word of data, by having a new uh, perspective on data, um, I think I have a broader understanding on data. So thank you very much. And also, the Bitcoin, I showed uh, one um, artwork that showed a transaction of uh, Bitcoins. The artist is a mathematician and a programmer. And in order to visualize those world, they thought out what would be an emotion that they can incorporate into their artwork. And they learned from the Hollywood movie depicting the universe, uh, uh, well, the cosmos. So by having this kind of the uh, visual artwork, uh, well, the, the artwork shows the uh, live transaction of Bitcoins that can be translated into narrative. But this, of course, comes from data. The source of this visual art uh, is data. So that kind of uh, interactive um, artwork is not possible. Thank you very much, Hasegawa-san. Right, so you run some redefined data that is much more anime than that could be a key to connect science and art. Uh, uh, Frederick, can you have a question for Ilan san Make it short, please. Yes, I try to make it short. Uh, so I just mentioning that Bruno Latour just wrote a paper uh, and, a, and a book uh, last month and addressed it to um, uh, 
uh, to politician, in fact, to ecologist, and uh, because there is a next presidential uh, election uh, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the year. And uh, it was about sustainability and desire. In fact, uh, if we try to, to tackle our question at a global level, uh, at a national level, uh, for example, uh, in fact, we, we, we face something with the two crises, we, with the, and the COVID uh, crisis, uh, a loss of, um, a loss of, uh, I would say, of desire, of enthusiasm, and how to, um, to work this question of how to raise a new enthusiasm to, uh, with people. And uh, behind your method and uh, what uh, the, Max developed this uh, before, uh, before the idea of leverage and, uh, and desire, how, how could we process? And at what scale should we process uh, to, in fact, to, to give hope to people and be invested in, uh, in those questions? Because I think it's a, the, question, the main question is a question of communication and how to, to give hope and to give, uh, in fact, access to people to those questions with pleasure, with, with happiness and, uh, and, uh, and desire. So thank you. Thank you, Frederick, for a marvelous question. Uh, not an easy one, but important. Um, I, I think one place to start, I mean, it's one thing to say, well, I'll tell you this wonderful story of how beautiful things are, and I will show you images through art, with music, with dance, that's great. And some people that will, for some people that will resonate. And then th that is inspiring. But for some people it isn't. And it means what I think we miss often is not how do we make a new narrative that does what you want, that is to raise that desire, but how do we listen carefully to the narratives that are actually engaged in society now. And when I say society, I really should say societies, plural, meaning that this is not a uniform global issue. It is very localized. And in fact, one of the things we found um, that we are just publishing some material about is that because of digital media, groups fragment and change perspectives, change affiliations very quickly because you can, it's a many to many communication. And the result is that you really have to look at each group or look at multiple groups and look at the context in which sustainability is relevant. So, what may be relevant and in fact critical and apparent in um, Alaska, in um, Kaktovik or wherever, doesn't mean an awful lot in um, Kibere slum near Nairobi. It's a different set of problems. But if you identify with the local problem, local concern, then and listen to the narratives in terms of what is alienating. It's, it's the other side of that joy and desire. Um, what is it that alienates the group? Why are these blame and misinformation so powerful? What is it behind that? And that's what we need to address in my view. That's a short answer to your question, but I think it's it's something that we need to think much more about. That's just a quick reaction from me. Thanks, Frederick. Thank you, Elon. I think it's time to receive the last question. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me there? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. Thank you all for these presentations. 
<clears throat> I wanted to return uh, to the question of uh, narrative again, mm -hmm. uh, because it seemed that we were saying that knowledge transmission involves some form of narrative. And I think that indeed it's true that things, art forms or rituals and so on that persist over a long period of time mm -hmm. do so because they remain sensible mm -hmm. to each generation. They communicate to each generation and they live really for each generation. And so in that sense, I wanted to ask Uno-san, your gagaku has survived for 1,200 years. Mm -hmm. And um, even though you mentioned that it hasn't changed very much, I still wonder whether from the perspective of knowledge persisting through time, mm -hmm you could think of Kagaku as being a contemporary art. And I wondered also uh, what Hasegawa-san might think about that question. So thank you very much. So first, uh, sorry, I wasn't listening. Sorry from uh, Ono-san first, and then Hasegawa-san. So uh, whether gagaku can be considered as a contemporary art, contemporary music, I, uh, to that question, I think uh, that is possible. Yes, uh, we can interpret it as a contemporary, contemporary art because uh, as music, it has great potential. Uh, I think that can be said with regard to gagaku. And uh, Takemitsu Toru, uh, uh, has uh, uh, he's a compo composer and uh, uh, he plays a uh, shuteika uh, just using gagaku instruments and so like, sometimes uh, as a professional or uh, the contemporary gagaku uh, is uh, sometimes uh, impossible but uh, this uh, composer's uh, uh, music uh, is very nice and uh, Silk Road uh the music uh, and instruments uh, came through uh, silk road to be uh, transported to japan and if it goes to the west uh uh, uh in greece uh, takemitsu san says that there is a uh, commonality uh, uh with the music there uh, uh in greece and uh, gagaku and uh, so uh so what takemitsu san composed is a uh, a gagaku that uh, we uh, can empathize and uh, so there is a room and potential for gagaku to become a music a contemporary uh, music but uh, at the same time gagaku also uh, has this uh, tradition of being uh, the uh, art of gods and buddha and i think we need to balance the two Hasegawa-san, please. So, uh, Takemitsu-san's uh, contemporary uh, art uh, music uh, activity is uh, really special. And uh, in his case, uh, Gagaku uh, is being updated uh, uh, as a contemporary art. And that is a transformation that we are seeing. So how can the gagaku spirit uh, uh, can be inherited and what uh, is to be renewed? I think there needs to be a very important discussion between the two. So my friend, post-colonial researcher, and I had a conversation the other day, and uh, the Western uh, theory and uh, unilateral uh, oriental tradition, uh, how this can remain uh, as a consolidated art in order to sculpture that demix, demix uh, is the word or terminology that can be effectively used. Demix, the concept of demix uh, uh, can be sculptured uh, for a dichotomy, but uh, also at the same time, what is inherited uh, can be renewed and uh, by and uh, there are different ways of uh, expressing that uh, transformation, ghost, uh, are the words uh, that can be used, but uh, these can be included uh, in the terminology of demix. 
Uh, so this was the kind of conversation that I had with my uh, friend who is an Indian. And uh, in that sense, uh, we uh, hope to have a very interesting uh, discussion going forward. So Gagaku, whether it can become a contemporary art or not, to this question, um, uh, when we look at, we need to look at the essence of gagaku, which needs to remain. And uh, there are uh, area where we can demic uh, with that it is. Uh, there are part of gagaku that can be renewed and updated and made contemporary. So, I think uh, there are various potentials to gagaku. Thank you, uh, Hasegawa-san. So, uh, time is up. Sorry to say. I have. Uh, been reminded of uh, Ogawa-san's uh, presentation about uh, gardening. He has, uh, or his family has uh, continued uh, to preserve the traditional way of uh, gardening. And uh, so he is a curator or curate, he is a, a doer of a curation of gardens. And uh, also what we just discussed uh, with regard to narratives, uh, Gagaku, uh, as uh, introduced by Ono San, uh, has a uh, narrative that need that must not change. At the same time, uh, there is a narrative to change Gagaku at the same time. And uh, I think uh, that is what I have come to think, uh, listening to the uh, conversations uh, by the three people. So Ilan and uh, Ono San and Hasegawa San, uh, Thank you very for your uh, inspiring uh, and uh, stimulating uh, presentations and uh, uh, conversation and discussion. So again, tomorrow uh, we will uh, have an academic session to start at uh, 5 p.m. Uh, I think it will be 9 a.m. in France. And I'm sorry for David, uh, in Boston, New York, it will be 3 a.m. Uh, so and again, tomorrow, let's uh, see you again at uh, uh, 5 p.m. Japan time. Thank you very much.